And we're in. How you doing, Sky? Oh, I'm great. How are you, Ryan? I can't believe I just found out you lived in China. Really? <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Like you said, we're going to have a lot to talk about. We will. We will. Uh, but I always love chatting with um, inspiring people who are trying to do things in the creative field and who are doing things in the creative field. And part of that, like, you know, that artistic struggle that we all, we all yeah. love. But, um, but how's your summer been, man? It's kind of like getting chilly again. Like things are, weather's changing. Yeah, it's been it's been good. You know, it's so funny. Like growing up, you think of the the seasons are so distinct because you have different types of school breaks and you're timing all these things. Mm -hmm. I just find the last few years, I, I'm not even thinking about the seasons. Plus, living in Southern California, like my first semester ever at college, I'm from Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. and it rains a lot there. Gets cold. We get snow maybe once a year, and it was November. Mm -hmm. I was out on the track practicing martial arts shirtless and i called my mom and i was like yes yeah, so I'll, I'll see you in a week for thanksgiving oh what am i doing i'm shirtless outside it's 72 degrees it was just totally mind-blowing you know coming from portland and uh so i have to say we're really lucky in la you know the weather is pretty mild it doesn't get too hot um summer's been busy mm -hmm. you know doing um uh, a lot of events, IMC live events, and so we had like um, I guess it's kind of fall summer junction for the mid autumn festival. Mm -hmm. I had like a bunch of different events going on. That was kind of starting the end of August, September, and whatnot. So what was it like growing up in Portland, apart from you know the poor weather? Yeah, <laughs> Portland. I think it's a really nice place to grow up. Well, I can't speak for exactly what it's like now because I haven't lived there for a long time. Mm -hmm. But growing up, you know, I lived in. An area that is the city, it's not the suburbs, but it's also not the touristy type area. So if you ever visit Portland, you're not going to go to my neighborhood. You know, you're going to go downtown, you're going to see a lot of very trendy places, most likely. And my area, um, I don't know, it was just, it was it was very urban, but pretty quiet in, in the pocket that I lived in. So how how much is Portland actually similar to that TV show Portlandia that we all watched? <laughs> so that's that's where you're gonna visit if you go on a vacation. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean that stuff is is real. It's a comedy show yeah. clearly, but but no, like you'll you'll find uh, real uh, restaurants like that and all all those kinds of things. But but there's another side to Portland that that if you're visiting you're not gonna see, and it's kind of um, I don't know. It's almost a little bit more kind of like a an East Coast vibe. Nah. What I'm trying to say is it's it's more very um almost like a working class type of area, you know, where people uh are just very, very middle class, lower middle class kind of living their lives, you know, and um and not necessarily on the cutting edge of everything. Mm -hmm. Uh even beyond the cutting edge, I think kind of is like that show would yeah. you know, lead you to believe. Interesting. And, uh, and has, has, I mean, I, I, I know you haven't lived in Portland for a long time, but you must have friends and family. Like, has Portland been caught up in this, like, zombie apocalypse of homeless people that you see in, like, San Francisco and then also in Seattle? Because Portland, Oregon is right, is right between them, also on the coast, right? Yeah, I don't really know. Okay. I, I didn't go to Portland for, I don't know, the whole pandemic. It was like five or six years I didn't go. And then I went two years ago and... I didn't spend a lot of time downtown. You know, I went to my old neighborhood, kind of went to some of the old restaurants I used to go to, saw some of my old friends, things like that. And so, you know, you I, I've heard stuff like that. I, I can't really say for sure. Um, but that's what some some stories will lead you to believe. So I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah, I was in uh, I was in San Francisco last summer. Okay. And I was in Seattle last summer and I okay. was shocked at the homelessness and the drug use on the streets yeah. in daylight hours and then going into like a CVS. And wanting to buy like a bottle of water and having to wait like ten minutes for some really? for someone to come and like unlock the freezers or the fridges where they have the because everything was just locked. Wow. Yeah. Okay. It's wild what's going on in this country. Yeah. Um, I should preface that by saying I'm Canadian and I've only oh. lived. <laughs> no, you didn't. You didn't uh, tell me that. And uh, and I've only lived in L.A. for a year, so I'm I'm still like getting okay. a hang of everything here, yeah. but obviously experiencing a lot. For the first time, and of course, it's an election year, and they got all these other problems. So it's it's been a wild ride talking to people on a weekly basis, like I am here on the podcast. I bet, um, and just getting to learn, you know, about what Americans think of their own country. That's what's so interesting about America. You'll talk to ten people, you might hear ten different things, which is it's actually a privilege, yeah. you know. And living abroad and whatnot, just 
it made me appreciate the diversity uh, here so much more. For instance, actually the area where I grew up in Portland had a very large Vietnamese population. And so growing up, that was just always a part of my life, having all these classmates from Vietnam, some of who had uh, immigrated at, you know, age five, six, seven, and came into our class and um, all the restaurants, you know, churches and things like that. And then when I later on, I started martial arts. My first martial arts teacher was Vietnamese. Okay. And we were doing a Chinese martial art, but he was Vietnamese. A lot of my classmates are Vietnamese. We had a Vietnamese flag in the studio. And and uh, that was definitely um, something that I really appreciate about growing up where I grew up, just having all kinds of different people um, together. That's wild. That, yeah. This definitely gives you like a rich childhood, right? Getting to learn about like different cultures, different backgrounds, different ways of life. Yeah. And what's really special, I think, is not just the learning. It's great to learn, but just to say, this is part of my life. I mean, just having all these kinds of people around me, that that's just America. That's just life, you know? It's really, really special. 350 million people all exercising the First Amendment rights, right? To freedom of speech. Well, sure, I mean, sure. Yeah, that's one way to put it. All on social media, all at the same time. You gotta love it. Yeah, I try not to spend too much time on social media, even though you know some people will tell you and you need to do it. Yeah. Um, but we try. So, um, so early years in Portland, um, you know, just living life. Like, what, what were you? What were you studying in school? What were your interests? Yeah, I was always interested in the arts. I was always interested in film and performing arts in many different ways. When I was, you know, a lot younger, I was really interested in special effects. I was always interested in sci-fi movies, horror movies, and I was really exposed by my parents to a lot of a lot of movies that not necessarily off the beaten path, but for some of my age, some of my generation off the beaten path. You know, we watched a lot of Australian new wave films. Oh wow, that's uh, strange. It's 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 just um I was really fortunate to be exposed to it. Because you can go back and watch uh, Shawshank Redemption, you know, which I've, of course I've done now and it was fantastic. But are you really going to go back and, and just watch Picnic at Hanging Rock, you know, if you've never even heard of that? I've never heard of it, but is it all just Nicole Kidman and Hugh Jackman in their teens? No, no. I mean, um, there's so many there's so many great films of that era. Peter Weir, you know. Oh, wow, Peter Weir, yeah. Peter Weir started in Australia. You know, he did this great movie called The Last Wave, which is actually kind of about the apocalypse. Okay. And then after that, he did the movie Gallipoli, which later on had a huge impact on my acting career and, and learning so much from a film like that. And then, and then of course, like, you could look at the Mad Max movies, you know, Australian films. And then I watched Escape from New York. These are movies my parents were showing me when I was in, like, third grade, you know. And that had such a huge impact on me. And I, I wanted to know how those movies were made. So I used to read tons about special effects and prosthetic makeup. And I thought I wanted to do that was like my first career path is I wanted to be a special effects makeup artist. That's wild. I know. And I would do all these like appliances on my face and stuff like that that I would read about in books. And then I said, well, okay, I have to write something, right? If I want to make movies, I, I, I'm at this point in my life, I have to write it. I have to shoot it. So then I would start writing these stories and I, I made like this like post-apocalyptic movie in eighth grade. It was like supposed to be my capstone project and it was like pretty violent actually because I was using all these makeup effects and stuff. Yeah. And then I had acted in it too, of course, as you do when you're making those kinds of films. So then I started getting more interested in the acting side and doing all these school plays and things like that. And that was very formative from a young age. And then I started martial arts, which I mentioned briefly earlier and started that in middle school and that just completely took over my life and and pushed it in a different direction and that's wild yeah i never expected it mm -hmm. i was watching a bruce lee movie with my brother i think it was like sixth grade as you do right yeah yeah and once again yeah a movie from 1973 <laughs> for some kid in the 2000s mm -hmm. and and i said i've always kind of wanted to try martial arts and and I'm kind of getting too old for like summer day camps and stuff. So maybe I'll look at something this summer. And my brother said, okay, if you do it, you have to do Chinese Kung Fu. Because that's what Bruce Lee did. And he was the best. Awesome. So I said, okay, well, fine. I'll just let's look up what do we have in Portland and Googled it. Okay, we have a Kung Fu studio. I went, I just signed up. I didn't know anything about it. Yeah. And, and I was the worst student in class. I mean, I actually hated going to that place. 
because I would be so afraid I was going to embarrass myself, mm -hmm. which I did. I mean, I was kicking and ripping my pants midair and, and falling on my butt and all this stuff. But our teacher, he would, he would use all these different maxims, you know, and he would tell us you have to practice every day. And one time I said, hey, um, can you show me the next move in this sequence? Because I think I got the other moves. And he kind of, he showed me like three new moves. And he did it so quickly, I, I couldn't even understand what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And I really couldn't learn it. Yeah. So at the end of class, he looks at everybody and says, you have to practice on your own every day. And when you're ready, then I'll teach you the next moves. Mm -hmm. And he didn't look at me, but I knew he was talking to me. Mm -hmm. And so after that, I started practicing before class in my backyard, after class in my backyard. I practiced on the, my lunch breaks mm -hmm. in school. And I just really wanted to be the best I could be. I became kind of obsessed with it. And I started working out. I started lifting weights. And I had been like the kid who was chosen last at recess. That's the worst. Uh, if I was chosen second to last, that was a great day for me. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. And so I completely devoted myself to this this sport and this art form that was kind of off the beaten path. And, and that started giving me more confidence in other areas of my life. And um, I had become involved in this arts summer camp um, in middle school. And I mean, it's a little bit of a tangent, but actually I was doing West African drumming. Oh, wow. And I had been, I had gotten like kind of serious into that for several years. And my teacher said, hey, listen, because we did it in school. And he said, okay, I do a summer camp and I want you to come to the summer camp and you can keep practicing, keep learning over the summer. Mm -hmm. So it was this great arts summer camp called Camp Caldera. It was sponsored by Wyden and Kennedy Advertising Agency. They work with Powerade. They work with Nike. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Nike also was a co-sponsor of it. So it was a very low cost, but they wanted to help uh, students who maybe couldn't afford like, you know, some kind of premium summer camp experience. They wanted to give students that experience. That's wonderful. We got to do horseback riding. We got to do whitewater rafting. Mm -hmm. And then um, you could choose which art discipline you wanted to do. They had African drumming, they had photography, they had poetry, and they had video production. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. So I went there for drumming. And ended up in video production. Because my second year there, we did like a final performance and I did a drumming performance. And then I saw what the video production guys were doing. You're not going to believe this. They did a movie called Samurai Showdown. Mm -hmm. And it was these two black belts. Mm -hmm. And it just completely blew my mind. And I had, by then, I'd been doing martial arts for maybe a year or something. And I saw what they were doing and I thought, oh my goodness, this is like a match made in heaven. And I told these guys, hey, next year at camp, I'm going to be with you guys. Mm -hmm. And I switched to video production. We started doing these every summer. We started doing these martial arts movies. That's amazing. It was an unbelievable experience. I mean, you're, my, you're like you're like 10 or 12? At that point, I was maybe 14. Yeah. Yeah. And I did that for several summers. And my video production mentor, he worked at the Wyden and Kennedy Advertising Agency. And he later won an Emmy mm. for the Colin Kaepernick commercial. I don't know if you saw it, the Nike Colin Kaepernick commercial. I've seen that one, yeah. He he edited that commercial. He won an Emmy for yeah, it. Wow. So I learned how to edit. I learned how to shoot. Mm -hmm. I learned how to pull focus and all this kind of stuff from him. And he was such a giving individual. And then that inspired me, okay, to go to film school. Mm -hmm. So now I want to go to film school. I'm Is this in high school? Like, is, you could, is high, yeah, so I started in middle school with the African drumming and stuff. And then I kept doing the camp. And I think if you kind of went through their full course, you could do it until about age 17. Okay. So, so I did that. I did that camp for like five years. But you're, but the high school you went to had like a full video production club. No, they didn't. Uh. But, but I was very fortunate that they started an apprenticeship uh -huh. program at the summer camp at Camp Caldera, mm -hmm. and so they let me go to the advertising agency during the school year. They'd give me a camera. I'd like check out a camera for them basically, mm -hmm. and I'd work on like one or two short films during the school year. I'd go to their office in downtown and I'd edit it on their computers. Mm -hmm. And then we'd do that throughout the year. When we came to the summer, we'd go there and I'd stay out there for like two or three months over the summer. What a great resource. It was incredible. Yeah. It was, it truly was a life changing opportunity. And it made me want to go to film school. It, you know, got me started doing fight scenes for the camera and things like that. And even doing acting because you have to, you have to act in your own films at, at that age. Yeah. And, 
yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be here where I am today and not even where I am, but just with the motivation, with the passion for what I do without one, starting the martial arts and two, being an apprentice in video production at Camp Caldera. Mm -hmm. So those two things, which were you know, Portland born, mm -hmm. uh, really, really influenced me a lot. That's wild. Do you know Dave Camarillo? I don't think so. He, um, he's a great guy. He was born kind of uh, in California, but then studied jujitsu ju um, and trained in Japan with a bunch of like the world's best jujitsu people. And his father was big in and his father really pushed him and his brother. And uh, they ended up, um, he ended up training under a really uh, specific, well-known jujitsu expert. And then they came back to, L uh, to California and he set up his own um, guerrilla jujitsu training school. And he was also coaching MMA fighters. He's coached a bunch of like championship yeah. MMA fighters. And then he just finished uh, last year. I think he finished the production on uh, John Wick. He was one of the um, no stunt stunt doubles, and he was responsible for like training Keanu Reeves on doing a bunch of cool shit. That's incredible. Yeah, but he was just on my podcast like uh, like uh, two weeks ago, and I just uh, released the episode yesterday. Oh, and I was listening to it. Out. Yeah, because like again, just another young person who got into martial arts, and then it just totally changed their life. Like confidence endurance um you know just that uh, just that desire to like um stick with things like push through all the difficulty that unbelievable determination that you get from like training like that like every day it's it's absolutely spectacular i remember i was in a karate class for a couple of years there and then my brother was in the karate class with me and i'm three years older than him and i think my dad pulled us both because we were just beating the shit out of each other all the time <laughs> Not an uncommon story. <laughs> yeah, so that was the end of that. And then he gave us a basketball and put up a hoop. And then our, our paths changed and we both got into basketball pretty heavily. But that was, originally we were doing um, some kind of Taekwondo, I think. Yeah. You know? I think every child should do it. Yeah. I think young people should do it. I mean, I think they should teach it in schools. You know, I think physical education should be a much bigger part of the curriculum. I don't know what it's like in Canada. It's at least in Portland growing up. Well, it was nice that we had the option in high school. Actually, we had elective courses, which were really good. Mm -hmm. But only one year was required. And then the rest of your high school career, your college career, if you're not going to do it. If, if you don't decide to do it, you don't exercise at all. Yeah. You know, um, Which is crazy. I know, because that is something that actually throughout your entire life, you're going to want to know how to do, mm -hmm. and you're going to want to keep doing. And I mean, I hate to rag on like calculus or something, you know, because obviously... We have people in our country that do that job at a very high level. They're engineers, they're architects, and, and it's very important. SpaceX going to the moon, all that kind of stuff. All stuff, but it's not for everybody. And the fact that it's compulsory to do three or four years, and, and I did it. You know, I went, I did it, AP calculus and all this stuff, and and it just, it wasn't really for me. And, and I don't, I can't do a single, like, integration or anything anymore, whereas I exercise every day. And I know how to exercise, which I, I did learn in school, but it was only because I had that passion for it from the martial arts because I wanted to get better. And I was, my level was so much farther behind everybody around me that I, I had to try to find every single way I could to improve myself. Were your parents like involved at all in film production or martial arts or anything? Like, yeah. Zero. They liked movies. Yeah. So like I mentioned, we watched all these different movies from around the world classic movies, niche movies, you know. We would go to the movies and see new releases. But um, no, they, they weren't involved whatsoever. And um, so I really, I really had to kind of forge this, uh, this path, you know. I mean, my father encouraged me to go to film school. But then the interesting thing was I loved acting. And I was doing theater uh, in school. And I knew I wanted to act. And my dad said, well, if you go to a good film school, then you're going to build this big network and then you can kind of do whatever you want, which is uh, true and not true and maybe more <laughs> leaning on the not true side. It's all, it's all relative, but, but I, w I was on that path and I had been doing the video production, so I had been acting in all of my short films, but I had also been shooting them and editing them. So I was kind of funneling, being funneled in a way towards this like filmmaking type of route, and so I applied to colleges it had film programs. I didn't even look at anything. I only applied to California schools. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents are from California. So I was born in Portland, but they lived in LA in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And so um, I ended up going to USC. Oh, they have a great film school. Yeah, yeah. They have the, it's always like, I guess, number one and number two between USC and NYU. Yeah. 
back and forth. But, you know, also you're in L.A. And, and that's where I really wanted to go. No winters for you anymore. Exactly. I was done with winter. You know, it's funny because growing up, snow, snow days are the best. Mm -hmm. We would used to have to wait in front of the TV and see, okay, they would like show like all these different obscure school districts in the state of Oregon. It would be a scroll down on the bottom of the screen. And nowadays you just look it up on the internet. Mm -hmm. But we would have to sit in front of the TV sometimes for like five or ten minutes and see like Grants Pass closed today, snow. Uh, bend, closed, snow. You're like, wait, 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 wait. Portland Public Schools, open. Oh, oh come on, why? Or, or closed sometimes. Mm -hmm. So snow days were the best. But um, I think it was my freshman year, actually, of college. And I just had, like you said, it's like endless summer in Southern California. Went back to Portland, and it snowed. It snowed so bad that we couldn't even leave the house. Because Portland doesn't have snow plows. They don't really like salt the roads or anything. They're not equipped for this because it doesn't happen as much as like the East Coast states. Yeah, the whole the whole West Coast doesn't understand like snow. Like I, I grew up in Toronto, Canada. Oh, okay. And if you have like some some days it would snow like a couple feet and of course you still had to go to school. Yeah. They just they just have an army of snow plows and they know how to get shit done, right? I know. I guess like, you know, the the investment is not really worth it if it snows like every year, every other year sometimes. Uh -huh. So we literally didn't leave the house for like three or four days. Oh that's nice though too. Is it? I'm a college kid, you know, I want to see my friends and stuff. By the end of that winter break, I'm like, I'm done with snow. Yeah. And I haven't ever been, I haven't been to Big Bear or anything. I haven't been uh, anywhere with snow really since then. Like Southern California can get pretty nice and pretty addictive, like just sunshine every yeah. goddamn day. I like it. Yeah. I was excited when it snowed in Beijing later, because I ended up living in Beijing later, and for sure we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I, yeah, I, I like personally just for me okay not recommending this for anybody else i like the lack of snow here it's amazing yeah so you're so you're what like 18 and you check in at usc yeah. southern cal film school program you love i got rejected film. actually oh did you so it's a it's really interesting like um most of my family didn't graduate from college and i had kind of like the will but i didn't always have the way you know, sometimes I had the way. Sometimes I'd be like, oh, okay, like, I, this guidance counselor would give me some advice or something, or my dad would, like, make sure, like, you know, oh, okay, we'll apply for your FAFSA, which is, I don't know, that's probably a U.S. thing. It's like this federal student aid application. Mm -hmm. So I knew that kind of stuff. But I didn't somehow realize that there was a separate application for film school. I just submitted my USC application and said, okay, cool, I checked off film. Hope I get in. And then, oh, maybe two weeks later, I guess I was looking up some info online, and I said, wait a second, there's a whole other application I was supposed to do. Yeah. So I rushed, and I, I filled it out, and then, of course, I got rejected because it's so competitive. They're not going to take anybody who's late. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just went as an undeclared major. I showed up, and then, like, about a week into the semester, I get this email, and it was uh, like, thank you for submitting your application to USC Film School. Please give us a call about and I thought it was probably some, like, robo-email or something. But they put you on a waiting list. I guess so. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know what it was. So they had a number there, so I just called them. And it was the admissions office at film school. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, um, I saw your application. And then I saw you didn't get in, but but I really, really liked it. So uh, if you want to get in, um, we can do that. And That's I was like, wild. I know. I said, what do you mean? What do I have to do? And he's like, just come into my office and sign this form. Give us your firstborn son. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't, I had no idea what it could be. Yeah. And I mean, I guess it was really just like this person said, I, you know, they, and USC did that a few times. They gave me a second chance. Sometimes it was financial. Mm -hmm. And I, I went to the financial aid office and say, hey, this is not adding up. I mean, I'm on the dean's list and I can't pay for this. Mm -hmm. And they would just say, um, okay, let's look at that. And then a week later, you get a check. I check my, I check my bank account. I'm like, where did all this money come from? Yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't know what the, the experience is of students now, but it, USC was very good to me, and I had a great experience. So, yes, yeah, so I, I enrolled in the film school. What was your specialty in the film school? So the way it was at that time was if you wanted, I wanted to be in production, mm -hmm. but you couldn't transfer into production. So they said, all right, we'll enroll you in critical studies, which is like the, the study of filmmaking kind of and criticism and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then after two years, you can transfer into production. How long was the program? It was four years. Oh wow! It's like a, so. It's a full undergraduate degree. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They're they're very serious about it. It's, it's pretty intense. So I did it for two years, but 
you know, I was also very serious about the martial arts. I never stopped the martial arts. Did uh, USC have like a team? Kind of. Um, originally, I wanted to go to UCLA because they had a very developed wushu team. This was the specialty I ended up kind of going towards. It's called wushu. Mm -hmm. And it's, I don't know if you've heard of it or not. Oh, yeah, I lived in China for 18 years. So you, know, hey. you know all about it, but for the, the audience that doesn't know about it, um, it's basically a modern sport that takes the elements of traditional kung fu and integrates them with the gymnastics and acrobatics and, and very athletic maneuvers. And then it's scored by a judge kind of uh, based on a floor routine that you perform. Uh, have you been to Shaolin Monastery? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay, we'll trade stories. <laughs> So I we just really, we have to let the narrative catch up to your China your China days. Okay. <laughs> well, I I decided that um, you know right before I went to college, I read this book called American Shaolin. Have you read this book? I haven't read American Shaolin. You got to check it out. No, I'm serious. I highly recommend it. I recommend it to anybody who's been to China or who wants to go to China or who's interested in China or martial arts. It's a true story. What year, what year did you read this book? When What year was your life changed by uh, America by Shaolin? Shaolin. Uh, and I've, I've corresponded with the author, Matthew Pauly, and he's a really great guy. It's his true story. This, for me, I read it in 2007. Okay. And he was a college student, just like I was about to be. Uh, I think he was at Princeton. And, and he loved martial arts. And so he was like studying Chinese philosophy, I think, in, in Princeton. And, and he was like doing some Kung Fu. And he kind of just had some, some moment where he felt like, I, this is not it for me. You know, this is not all there is for me. I need more. I want to be like these guys in the Kung Fu movies. I want to have this experience. And it was partly... Uh, the philosophical and religious aspect, and it was partly the physical aspect of training in martial arts. So he dropped everything, and he just moved to China. I love that. And this was like 1991. There was no internet. Yeah. He literally didn't know where the Shaolin Temple was. He had to go to Beijing, and he went on the street, and he asked people, hey, how do I get to the Shaolin Temple? Yeah. And, and uh, eventually someone said, oh, yeah, take this train and get off here, and then you walk off this hill. <laughs> And, and he did it, and he lived there for two years. Oh, he lived at the monastery? He lived at the monastery and trained there for two years, and I think he was the first American to ever do that. So the, so we should just let people know you're, you're watching. Um, like Shaolin Monastery is actually a monastery. It's a functioning monastery, but it's also um, like a martial arts training center. And for those who don't know, there's martial arts live performances everywhere in China all the time. So this program at Shaolin kind of prepares this generation of of performers and presenters that go around China and even around the world doing this wushu kung fu like in front of global audiences so Shaolin is really like the beating heart of of, of wushu and kung fu training yeah. yeah and I ate all that up you know because I was as, as I told you I was obsessed with kung fu and the Shaolin temple is the birthplace of Chinese kung fu as we know it so I read this book, and you learn a lot about Chinese culture through this book. You learn a lot about the Shaolin Temple and what life was like there. It's in, it's in Hubei or Hubei? Hunan. Oh, it's in Hunan. Yeah, that's Hunan. right. Yeah. So I, I wanted to live this. You know, I wanted to do it. And I said to myself, look, I've been studying Kung Fu for years now, and, and I know I can go there and, and do my own version of this. But you were still in university. This is, this is the summer before college. Oh, really? So the perfect time. It was absolutely the perfect time for this to happen to me. Mm -hmm. Because no, no one in my family had ever been out of the country. And I said, how am I going to do this? You know, I can't pay for this. I, I don't even know like what, what getting a visa and all this stuff. Like, I don't know anything about it. So I said, well, I'm about to start college. There's study abroad in college, right? Oh, for sure. So I'll make my college pay for it. Mm -hmm. So I, I looked up the program. They had a study abroad program in Beijing. And I knew like the Beijing Wushu team was very famous. Like Jet Li came from the Beijing Wushu team. So I figured that that's a that's a name from the past. That's a well, that's a Jet that's a classic. <laughs> I love uh, Jet Li movies were great. Man, I just uh, did this event. They asked me to perform at this event about a month ago. It was the 50th anniversary of Jet Li and the Beijing Wushu team performing for Richard Nixon. Oh wow! On his visit to China when China opened on the, up on the White House lawn. Oh wow! I think Nixon went first, and then the Beijing Wushu team came after, and Jet Li was like like nine or something. That's fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so I decided, okay, I'm going to study abroad. And you had to take Chinese for 
it's like three years, I think. Two year, two years, I guess, four semesters. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, okay. And they did they, they didn't have a language requirement. And most people would probably take, you know, a couple of semesters of Spanish or something, or some people would test out if they did high school stuff. Something you could learn use in Southern California. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Well, you can use Chinese too. Yeah. And there's a lot of Koreans in Southern California. Oh yeah, sure. I live near Koreatown, you know. And, and there's so many options. I mean, I wish I could have studied all those languages. But uh like my first semester when I signed up and I said, Okay, and like, you know, okay, there's I'll do these general education classes. I'm, I took a film class. And I said, and I want to take Chinese for my language. The academic advisors were all like, are you sure? Are you sure? You know, it's really hard. Are you sure you want to do that? It's damn hard. But I had to. I was like, yes, this is my plan. So yes, I'm going to do it, of course. That's amazing that you had like the vision to have a plan to get yourself to Beijing somehow after the language requirements, you know, to train and study and follow that path and to do it all through the school program. That's pretty, pretty well thought out. I was just obsessed, man. I was obsessed with martial arts. And I think if you have a vision for something that you really want to do, I think that's like the superpower because a lot of people don't even really know what they want to do. They're not quite sure. And no one has, no one has a vision. Out. <laughs> well, I would say nobody, but, but I, I think that is like, if you have that vision, you can do it mm-hmm. because you already know where it is you're going, right? You just have to figure out the way to get there. And you have to be very specific. That's what can be challenging, especially like in the entertainment industry because it's so multifaceted, you know? Um, you might have to expand your vision into different routes, right? But in sports, it's a, it's, it's a great metaphor for life in terms of uh, how you can work hard at something and then succeed. But it's, it's not necessarily, uh, it's much simpler, you know? It's much more direct. If I lift weights, I get stronger. If I learn Chinese, I'm eligible to study abroad. So, so I, I had that vision, and I was just able to just apply that the same way I had been, you know, training in martial arts. And I just kept taking Chinese. I kept t- taking Chinese semester after semester, and and I was really actually having a lot of fun because the Chinese program was really great at USC. I was really lucky, and they would they would force us to like do uh, skits in class every other week, and then they would force us to come in for office hours and just chat with. Them, the in teachers. Chinese, in Chinese, yeah. So it was really a lot of exposure, and then um, I ended up switching my major to Chinese. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, from film because I was just having so much fun, and I was I wanted to compete, mm-hmm. and it took a lot of time, and I was kind of worried that with how serious the film program was, I wouldn't have time to also train and compete. So I ended up switching to a Chinese major, and then I did a theater minor. And so I did a lot of acting classes too. Um, what do you prefer more, the the stage or the or the film production? For me personally, I like film and television, just because as someone who likes action, as someone who likes sci-fi and horror, you can accomplish a lot of things visually, you know, that are much harder on stage. Like choreographing a fight scene for the stage has a lot of big differences from doing it for film, you know, with all the different angles. It's actually way easier on film because I can do a kick. And I can probably be about six to eight inches away from your face, and it will look great on camera if everything's lined up right. Mm-hmm. On stage, you know, you have to have the angle just right for the audience, but then if the audience is all the way on the left wing, it might not look that great, you know? And you have to stage everything just so, and then you only have one take, too. <laughs> it's live, baby. Yeah, yeah. So for me, and just being so influenced by films growing up, I really like acting uh, for film. Okay. So, um, so you switch your majors. I switch my major. That's ballsy, by the way. Like yeah. the, the film, the film school gives you a second chance, and then you're like, "Yeah, I'm in the film school." And then you're like, "Fuck off, I'm taking Chinese." That's a good point. You know, it was funny too. After after I switched my major, I was like, "Hey, could I still take this film class?" And they're like, "Yeah, sh- sure." So I still I signed up for another film class, but then it got canceled. You're probably you know? the, you're probably the only person that dropped out of film school to study Chinese. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I don't know. You're a visionary, though. I mean, can you imagine, like, you know how, like, you know how great it would be for business, like, if more people had, like, if more people had a North American education and were also fluent in Chinese. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely given me a lot of business avenues. You know, not not only in China, but just here, right, in the the vibrant Chinese community that is in Southern California. It's it's really really big. Well, my buddy Mark, um, he was uh, he's also from Canada. He's he was like the famous most famous foreigner in Dashan. Yeah, you know Dashan? I know Dashan. I don't know. I know of Dashan. 
Oh, I... He was in um, American Shaolin. That's when I first learned about Da Shan. Yeah. It's because they talk about him, and apparently everybody was telling this author, Matt Pauly, like, wow, your Chinese is good. They'd always say, ah, it's not as good as Da Shan's. Or some people say, oh, it's better than Da Shan's. And he's like, mm. yeah, I'm sure. Tra- amazing. Yeah, he's great. I'm supposed to see him this week, actually. Oh, he's really? he's in town, yeah. He is incredible. Yeah. And I, I've watched like his stuff on YouTube, and he's really funny, too. I mean, I saw like a stand up bit he did. Yeah, he's doing a lot of stand up these days. It was amazing. Yeah, he's wow. fucking hilarious, actually. Like, he's. Like, we used to meet up in Beijing quite often, like, uh, for a drink, because uh, he's always been going back and forth between Canada and, and China to do his, like, live events and a bit of stand-up and stuff like that. But I would always, like, catch up with him when I was in Beijing or he was in Shanghai. And, um, and uh, no, he's absolutely, like, the sweetest guy. And, um, uh, yeah, but everyone compares you to, to him oh, when you yeah. first go. And he's on every fucking billboard. <laughs> if there's... If there's a white guy on a billboard in like in the early 2000s, it was him. Yeah, I mean, I think that was probably his heyday, like the 90s and 2000s. For just for the audience, Da Shan, it literally means big mountain because I heard he's very tall. Big white guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so he has like unbelievably fluent Chinese, and he's very charismatic and funny, and so he just became this like huge sensation in China at a time where there weren't like really hardly any white people who spoke Chinese. Well, the thing was, so, so, so his kind of, um, his kind of claim to fame is, is obviously like he came early, yes, yeah. but he stayed. So, you know, like a lot of people came in the eighties. Um, and then when Tiananmen Square happened, June 4th, 1989, like the, everyone left. Um, and then China, like it didn't officially close, but like no one wanted to do business with the Chinese. So no one, like no foreign business people went there. Very few students went there. Like China kind of like unofficially closed for like the early 90s, like for three or four years there. So anyone who stayed through that um, and who got to see China like kind of close and retract from the global stage, um, I think they had like a really unique experience. Like, and he was there all through like that experience and then also the 90s. So I didn't, I didn't arrive till 2001. Um, okay. But by the time I got there, he was, yeah, already huge. I went, I think, at a really great time. Um, it was Everything was very open. Mm-hmm. It was 2009 was the first time I went. That's when I studied abroad at Peking University. And that's okay. So that's after your first two years of film school. Then you switched. So you're doing Chinese. You're doing your martial arts. So was it like your third year in 2009? That was, yeah, yeah, the fall semester of my junior year. Amazing. And uh, it was just such an incredible experience. That was my eighth year in China. That's <laughs> wild. You were in Shanghai, you said, right? Yeah, so I I uh, I graduated university in May 2001, and then by September 2001, actually I I flew like like 10 days or something after the 9/11. Uh, oh, yeah, I flew and I went to China and had a, had a blast. Traveled around for a whole bunch of months, loved it, and then I just decided to stay. And then I was there for 18 years. That's incredible, man. Yeah, yeah I mean, I was there for like one and a half years in, in total, um, and it was completely unforgettable. I can't even imagine being there for 18 years. But I love Shanghai, actually. Yeah, it was good. It was a good town. I just liked Shanghai because it was a little bit more open, a little bit more Western. I love I love the river, and it was a little closer to Hong Kong, where I had a lot of friends, and uh, I was still playing a lot of rugby in oh. Hong Kong, which was a lot of fun too. So, um, so that was great. And and so, what was it like for you? You know, getting on an airplane in L.A., going to sleep, and waking up in Beijing. I I didn't sleep. I was so excited. Yeah, no, I'm serious. Like I had never been on an international flight. I mean, I think. Yeah, literally, I had flown from Portland, L.A. I mean, you had to get a passport. I, I had my passport, but I had to get the visa, and there was, like, an issue with my visa, too. Oh, it was because I applied for my visa, and then um, I think I had to renew my passport or something like that. Uh, when I had, you know, when I had applied for study abroad, it was, like, it was like six months before because, like, you had to do it, like, the previous semester and stuff. Sure. So I applied. I put all my, my visa, or, sorry, my passport stuff on there. And then when I sent in my passport to get the visa, it was rejected because I had I had renewed my passport. Yeah. But then they were able to sort it out. I got my visa like the day before I left. And it, it worked out, but it was a little bit uh, nerve wracking. So, uh, yeah, I, I was so excited for me. Anytime I go someplace, because I've been out of the country a few times now, but not as much as someone like yourself. No. It's still every time I'm going to go somewhere, it's not a real for me until we're in the air okay so that's so it. even like looking forward to it i was like and it, it was funny because the summer before i went to china was the worst summer of my life it's like my my college girlfriend had cheated on me i was working sales at Foot Locker, which was 
you know, a little soul crushing. Uh, there was like something how I was, I was supposed to get my black belt in Kung Fu from my first instructor. And he's like, okay, uh, you're going to be testing like uh, September 20th. And I'm like, I'm going back to school. Yeah. I can't, I can't test. And, oh, okay. <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> Just fuck off. So I couldn't, yeah, I didn't get my black belt, even though I was, I was at like the equivalent level of everybody. We were all going to test together and then. I couldn't test. And so it was just one thing after another. Oh, and then I mentioned there's some issue with like financial aid and stuff. And, and I was like, man, what else really could go wrong? You know, because I didn't get injured. Mm-hmm. That's, that's good. But everything else was just like really, really, really tough. And I just kept telling myself, I know Beijing is going to be awesome. I know it's going to be awesome. Just, just push through the next few months. It's nice to have things like that to like look up to, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast when you're, have this structure with school and the seasons and the breaks. It kind of, you always have something, you know, is going to happen for sure, mm-hmm. uh, barring any kind of catastrophe. You know, you're like, well, there's going to be another semester. There's going to be a spring break, the study abroad, whatever the case may be. So you, you do have these things to look forward to. And, you know, I, I got on that plane, man, and I was so excited. There's no way I slept. No. And, 2009, so this is right after the Beijing Olympics. It was, which was a good time to be in Beijing because they still had a lot of hype. Yeah. They still had that infrastructure that they had built for the Olympics. It was new, and it was just a very international place, was, especially at Peking University. I mean, it's like one of the best universities in the world. Mm-hmm. So it was it was an incredible experience. I got to do so many things. Like, there was a talent show, and for I, I think it was probably an international student's talent show. Someone told me about it, and I said, yeah, sure, why not? So I did a martial arts performance. And basically, I didn't know this, but like we were being scouted by this, this international talent department, kind of, at the university. And they put on a show every year, an international cultural festival, and lots of people come and check it out. And then they kind of like have this like performing troupe, and they like go across Beijing, and they tour to different universities. They go on television stuff. Mm-hmm. So they saw me perform, and they're like, hey, we want you to be like one of the main dudes in our PKU performance troupe. That's wild. It was it was awesome, man. I mean, like, we would have rehearsals twice a week. We had to do this little dance. And then uh, during, like, the instrumental break of the dance, I would pick up a sword and, like, do this whole routine. Mm-hmm. So I got to meet in, in this group. They wanted it to be super varied from all different countries. I met people from, like, the Congo. I met people from Tajikistan, from Russia, from Thailand. And it was, I like, I made all these friends just through these activities that I kind of almost stumbled upon. Mm-hmm. And then we went, you know, we performed on CCTV, me doing the sword and everything. It was, it was awesome. And they paid us for the rehearsal. And then after every rehearsal, we'd all eat dinner together, family style. You get to know everybody. And mm-hmm. it was a really, really cool experience. I made a lot of great friends there. And, uh, but of course I had to do martial arts and you know, that was my whole reason I went there. So some dude in the Chinese department, he was like a PhD student or something. He, he walked up to me one day. He's like, hey, I heard you go to Beijing. So he gave me this flyer and he said, I saw these, these guys performing when I was in Beijing and they were like incredible martial arts masters. So I like called them when I got to Beijing and it turned out they were master's students in Wushu. That's incredible. Because they have a lot of specialized, you know this, they have a lot of specialized universities there. They have like a whole university for film. Mm-hmm and engineering, and sports. So these guys were at local sports university doing wushu, and uh, they were just like only a few years older than me, and I would just go to their university like five times a week and just train privately with them for a couple hours. That's an epic opportunity. It was amazing, man. It was, and anyway, we became friends. We would like eat lunch together. They, I would go into their home, and like they had kind of an extended family, mm-hmm. and, and they were like so curious about me because these guys are from the country. So to have like a foreign friend, it's almost like a sign of status, you know, and it's great practice for my Chinese and we'd eat these home cooked meals together. It was really, really special. Yeah. No, it is kind of a status symbol to have a foreign friend as for sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then uh, there was like a lot of, I don't know if you call it fate or luck, but it was all working for me in this trip because our study abroad program, they had two trips planned for us that semester. And one of them was to, um, Nanjing. Oh, yeah, Nanjing. And the other one was to Shaolin Temple. Beautiful. I couldn't believe my luck that I didn't, I didn't have to think, you know? I just, they facilitated everything for me. And I was so hyperactive, like, on the train and on the bus. Like, I couldn't believe we were going to see the Shaolin Temple. Like, it was really happening. 
It's such an epic place. It is, man. It's all the stuff that you read about and all the stuff you see in movies. It's there for real. You can touch it. Mm-hmm. And and I, I had to buy the T-shirts and all this kind of stuff because I was I was just so excited. And then the the tour guide said, "Hey, does anybody here do kung fu?" Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, like raising my hand, of course, like you know, jumping out of my seat. And she said, "Okay, listen, we're gonna go to see the monks perform, and they do a part in the middle of the show, where they pick audience members to come up on stage and learn a few movements, and then the audience will applaud. And if you're the winner, you get a special prize. And of course, you won." <laughs> I did. They sat me right up in front. Yeah. I practically just jumped out of my seat, you know, and they pointed to me and I ran up on stage. And I I still have a video of it. I did this, like, tiger-style move. The monk did it. it I mean, for someone who was, like, uh, had been learning martial arts, it was pretty simple. Um, but I did it, and I did it, like, perfectly. And the entire audience was, like, awestruck. Because who could have predicted that, right? And uh, it was it was it was awesome, man. And then... That's the first time I experienced like everybody wants to take pictures with you. Oh, that's a that's dangerous. <laughs> yeah, they were like my my teachers are like Sky, like listen, we gotta go. Okay, mm-hmm. stop taking the photos. And you know it was really hard because everybody just kept coming up, coming up. There was another guy, one of my friends from study abroad. He's like, dude, someone just asked for a picture of me. I think they thought I was you. <laughs> I got a story for you. In two thousand one, I was in Shanghai when Beijing when they announced that Beijing won the Summer Olympics for 2008. Wow. So I was staying at some like cheap guest house on the Bund, which is where all the cheap guest houses were back in the day. And um, Probably not anymore, right? It's probably expensive now. Uh, everything's expensive now. When I, was, when I lived in China, in Shanghai, I, when I first lived in Shanghai, it was so cheap. And it allowed me to like do a lot of things creatively that I would have never had the chance to do if I like grown up here. But I remember I was staying in this hostel. It was like 10 bedrooms. It was like 10 bunk beds or whatever in one room and uh and someone was like listening to the radio or someone had the tv on and it was like oh beijing just won the summer olympics for 2008 it was just announced like five minutes ago and within like an hour there must have been like a million people on the bund like which which for people who don't know in shanghai the bund uh, separates east east uh, shanghai from west shanghai pudong and pushi and uh yeah a big river uh but it's beautiful and and so like I went out with a bunch of these people that I was staying with and we just kind of like got swept up in the in the excitement of it all. But while we were out there, there were so few foreigners that everyone stopped and wanted to take a photo with me um, and a few other guys as well. So it, like you have to understand, like when there's like a, a mob of Chinese people out there like celebrating and doing <laughs> things, all they want to do is take photos. And if you're if you're a foreigner and you're not like from there. Like, I swear to God, I probably had my photo taken like a thousand times. And this was before. At least, man. I mean, you're, I think you're undercounting. <laughs> and this was before phone, like, cameras were on phones, right? Like, this is 2001. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. What made you move to China? Well, so I played basketball in university. Uh, what university? Uh, university of Toronto. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah, and I just had an amazing four years, and I wasn't good enough to play pro. And I didn't want to stick around in Toronto and just, like, exist like I wanted to get out and do something different and I just felt like I, I took a few classes in in university about China so I studied like international politics okay. and uh, just was like well if I'm gonna fucking you know get a job and just live in Toronto for the rest of my life I'm gonna go to China first and check it out and I did and I was just like wow this is amazing so I just decided the version of myself in China was someone that I really liked and the version of myself in Toronto was someone that I was tired of and wanted to escape from so so I just moved to China, and then, and then, yeah, 18 years later, I didn't leave until, like, early 2019. Yeah, so for the first for the first while, I taught English. So, like, most people, I did that for, like, six months just to, like, stable myself, find some roommates, find some friends. And then um, and then I cut a deal with the school where, where I was, like, I would work, like, three weeks and then take one week off. And that one week off, I went, went to, like, Shaolin. I went to all these places, and I did photography. So I was doing photography and writing, and then... And then I got a magazine to start uh, paying me to do that. So then I would take a week off, you know, every month. And then I would go out and make make a story and get some shots. And I was going to, like, remote villages in Yunnan. I went to Tibet. I went out to Xinjiang province. Like, I, I started exploring the whole country, just taking pictures. And then, of course, because of that, I had a really good portfolio of just random wild shit from all over China. And then that's how I got in with the New York Times. And then I covered China with the New York Times for, like, 10 years. That, yeah. that is amazing. Yeah, I did that till like... 2010 or so when I started making television shows and then I rode a motorcycle around China with my brother and we set a Guinness World Record and then we made a TV show about that and that was our first TV show. 
Yeah, because I like I knew all of China and no one else did, right? So I was like, I got to ride a motorcycle around this, and we got to film it and show people like how diverse and crazy this country is. And then we did it, and that was like the start of my television career. Man, it's so cool to hear anybody who has like a very unique China experience, you know. And and some people they do just like you know they teach English for a couple of years or something, which is. Obviously, you're going to have so many unforgettable experiences doing that. But then to hear like your path of how you, you started out teaching English and then you did your own photography and then you worked for the New York Times and other magazines and all these things. Mm -hmm. And then to film a television show. I mean, that is really interesting to hear. Yeah, it was a wild ride. Like, like the whole point of going to China at like 22 or whatever, however, however old I was, I think I was 22. And like to go to China at 22, like you got to go and take risks, right? Like you got to go yeah. and like try things out. Like, but this is what you don't understand because I told you I was working at Foot Locker for the summer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, uh, obviously we probably share some like similar DNA in terms of you want to do something. Okay. Go ahead and try it, do it. Right. Yeah. But not everybody thinks like that. It's going back to that same thing. We talked about vision that, you know, just having the vision is a superpower. And I remember my manager at Foot Locker saying, you know, what you're doing is incredible, Sky. I'm like, what do you mean, man? I'm going to college. My parents told me to go to college. I'm going to, I, I studied, and I'm going to college. And he said, no, like, look at your, your coworker, Dave, you know? Like, he's, he graduated from high school like you, and he's going to community college. Mm -hmm. You could stay here your whole life, but you're not only going to college in another state, you're going to China? And, you know, he didn't know anybody who'd been to China. I didn't know anybody who'd been to China. So, like, same thing with you. I mean, just the fact of, of taking that leap and saying, sure, let's let's just trust. Mm -hmm. um, that's not common. I Well, I figured out at a pretty young age that um, you can get a lot in life if you have a good story. And for everybody listening at home, okay, <laughs> write that down. <laughs> because, yeah, yeah, because like, you know, if you have tried to do things and failed, you've got great stories. And if you've tried to do things and succeeded, you've got great stories. And if you're sitting at a cocktail party or you're at an event and you strike up a conversation with people and then you start getting into some crazy shit that you did, like when you're in your 20s, like that really does set you apart. And it sets you apart in such a way that people are, people start to gravitate towards that. People want to work with you. People want to collaborate. People want to like capture some of that energy that you are putting out into the world. And if you're putting out a lot of like positive energy, you're trying to do things, you're trying to create things, you're trying to generate opportunities for yourself and people around you, like eventually that works and you can get more out of what you want in your life because of that. And I, I've, I figured that out, I don't know, in like my late teens, early twenties. And, and I just was like, well, China's part of my path. Like that's gonna be part of my story. And when is the China chapter gonna end? I don't know but I'm going to try to do as much cool shit while I'm here. And I need to see as much as I can in order to like cement those experiences so that I can own them. And then one of the great things I started doing was um, once I started doing the photography and stuff like that, I started to go back to the university of Toronto and teaching in my China class that I was in when I was a student. So the professor, the, so the professor would just be like, well, you know, professors don't get to go to China every summer. And you probably know way more about China than I do about current, you know, day to day China, because you've been living there already for two or three years and I haven't been there for four years or whatever. So he's like, come back and tell us what you're seeing. And I had all the photography and the stories and the maps. So I would take over his class for like, you know, once I did, I did like one class, you know, once a year when I would come back to Toronto to see family and stuff like that. And that really got it cemented in my brain, like people really catch on and are inspired by those kinds of stories. And I was like, well, I, I can do that my whole career. I can just keep trying to find these stories, keep trying to find these ways of getting into people's hearts and minds, right? And then and then eventually it's like, oh, you make TV and then people wanna watch the TV. Like it's, it's just all that same kind of like putting out that attractive energy that you hope you can get people kind of hooked on. What was your experience with culture shock? Um, I, I knew what I was walking into and it didn't bother me at all. Like the, no, the no one speaking English, no problem. Like, I think that was the most fun part actually. Cause like, well, you know what I did is I had, I didn't get the chance to study uh, for two years like you did. So I went into China. I didn't know any Chinese. I didn't have any friends in China. Yeah. So what I did was I had this, um, 
And the, actually, my first trip to China, I didn't I didn't land in Shanghai. I landed in Hong Kong, uh, and then I across the border into Shenzhen, and then I went up the East Coast, and then all the way out to Xinjiang, the border of Pakistan, and then I went all the way down to Tibet, went to Everest Base Camp, and then out through like Yunnan, Guangxi, back to back to Hong Kong, and then I went home for Christmas, and then I moved back to Shanghai the next year, um, the next month actually, um, but. But that so that first trip when I was going around China, like I had to buy train tickets, I had to eat, I had to get find a guest house, I had to do all these things, and what I would do was I I couldn't pronounce the words to save my life. <laughs> it's tough. It, it it's is. Tough. So what I would do is I would get my guidebook, and I would have a notepad, and in the notepad I'd have like a hundred pages in the notepad, on, and and for every page in the notepad I had a different food that I liked. I had a, I had oh. a, I had a different I had a different like train ticket. I had some names of cities. Um, I had, uh, you know, the class of train I wanted to travel on, the the class of hotel I wanted to try to stay in. And I had a, just a list of all these words so that, because for people who are watching, you don't know, you know, you go into a train station in China and there's a thousand people in line and everyone's pushing. When you get to that window, if you can't speak Chinese, people are going to physically just push you out of the way so that they can order the ticket. So I had everything on this notepad. So I would just put the notepad up to the window and the lady or the man behind would read and be like, oh, he wants to take a night train sleeper bed to, you know, to Xi'an. How did you write it? I just copied it from the from the guidebook. So it was a, like I traced it. It, it had like uh, English and it had Chinese characters too. Yeah. And I just copied the Chinese like characters. This city, write the Chinese character. Would you write, draw an arrow or something? Pretty much. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a very ingenious solution. Because I just couldn't, I, I didn't have like a, I didn't, like we didn't have apps on our phones in 2001. Like we didn't even have mobile phones. Um, you know, we didn't have, um, like Duolingo or all these apps. Like we didn't, I just had this like paper book and, and just walking around, I wasn't picking up any of it. And actually I, I lived 18 years in China and I didn't really learn much Chinese, which is crazy. People say like, oh, exposure is the best way to learn. And I don't, I don't believe that because I only learned from classes. Now I practiced what I learned like in China on the streets with friends, but I always improved the most when I was learning in class. Yeah. That's the best. I really figured out something was so I I, I figured out at some stage that I'm like tone deaf, oh, and I yeah. and I think that 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 um, had some influence. Like I can't I can't play musical instruments for the life of me, um, and I I figured this out. I was in a Chinese class in Shanghai, and I was there were five of us, and it was me and four jazz musicians. Oh, so they're probably pretty good. It's easy for them to pick this stuff up. They started way behind me and passed me so fast. And they just picked up the tones and the language so quickly. And I was just, and I was like, wow, because they're, I think it was because they were so musical. And, and that always, I, could, I couldn't pick up the tones, couldn't hear the tones, couldn't, like I could kind of speak the tones. And because I'm foreign, like people would kind of give me a pass if I mis- misrepresented a word or, a, or, a, or a, a tone or something. So I was able to kind of like get by and I could get around and I could order food and I could do it all by the end, like when I left, okay. but I was never like fluent. So my dad was in the music business, <laughs> and he played music every day from birth, from pre-birth, when I was in the womb, at dinner, every night. We, he just put on a CD or a record or something. Mm-hmm. And my mom later said, like, I think that's why you were able to learn Chinese, because you had just grown up with the music every single day. Mm-hmm. So it's really interesting that you point that out. Yeah, I think it's a huge uh, bonus if you want to learn um, a language that's as tonal as Chinese to have, like... A musical background i think it, it'll really make your progress a lot faster yeah yeah i i, I didn't even know it at the time it's funny how like you you can't control things like that but when you trace your steps back why why do i love chinese mm. oh and you look at you know what else happened in your life huh maybe that's the reason yeah maybe i don't know like i was on music too when i was a kid but it was all like whatever records my dad had kicking around so I didn't, I didn't consciously think of it and I never got a chance to really play an instrument uh, because I was too involved in sports at a young age. So, so it sounds like you didn't, I mean, I don't know, you haven't described it, but like, did you ever have a time in China where you're like, oh my goodness, like I can't, I can't do this. I can't go out of my apartment. I want to go home. I don't understand this. Like I miss burgers or what, poutine or whatever. (laughs) Poutine for Canadians. Yeah. (laughs) But they, but they had a McDonald's in Shanghai and Beijing and they had a Pizza Hut, like all these like fast food options. They had them all. And eventually, like it took a fucking long time, but eventually they started getting like Starbucks because okay. like Chinese people for decades, like just didn't drink coffee. And it was driving me crazy because like I couldn't get out and grab a coffee anywhere. And then eventually, like I remember the news headlines because I was working for the New York Times at the time. And 
Um, I think I actually had to go into a Starbucks and get a photo of a Chinese lady making a coffee at one stage um, <laughs> for, the, for the paper. But, um, but it, you know, then everyone's it's all in the newspapers like Starbucks takes a big bet on Chinese people drinking coffee. Ridiculous. Like they're tea drinkers, like blah, blah, blah. Oh, and, then, and then Starbucks becomes like China's biggest market or China becomes Starbucks' yeah. biggest market for like a decade or more which I thought was great. And then, and then eventually after that, everyone was like, oh my God, Chinese people drink coffee? And then there were all these like artisanal coffee shops opening up in all the little neighborhoods. And then, of course, probably when you were there, by the time you were there, there, there were lots of, yeah. Plenty of Starbucks. Yeah. yeah. For me, culture shock was, you know, a challenge to overcome. But actually, every time that I, I lived, like kind of stayed in China for an extended period twice. And both times, the reverse culture shock was the hardest for me. Coming back to America. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. readjusting. It's huge. And yeah. we had been fortunate that, like, before we went through study abroad, we had to, like, go to a few seminars, and we learned about this stuff. And so I knew what was happening, but, man, it was really, really challenging. Did So you, you mentioned uh, um, American Shaolin or Shaolin? American Shaolin by uh, Matthew Pauly. By Matthew Pauly. Hey, Matt. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Um, so that, that, that book changed your life, right? So I had a similar book that I read by Peter Hessler called, uh, two years on the Yangtze. So Peter Hessler was a, a graduate, I think of Princeton or Yale university. I can't remember studied a, in the Chinese program. And then he joined the Peace Corps. Uh, and then he got sent to uh, a really small town called Fuling, I think on the Yangtze river. And it was a part, it was a town that was going to be flooded for the three gorges dam. So his whole book that he wrote was his two years in the Peace Corps teaching English in a town that was going to be um, flooded to build the Three Gorges Dam in central China. What year was that? So I think he was Pete was writing this in like 95, 96, and then I think it came out in like 98, 99. Kind of a similar time period, more or less, to like the American Shaolin story. Yeah, but he had a lot of culture shock when he first went there. Like, yeah. Especially in, a, I mean, well, you know, Hunan, the small village, uh, mm -hmm. Dungfeng, it's called Dungfeng, that's where the temple is, yeah. and this village too, it's... It's so different. Yeah, but I think, um, but, you know, for Pete to, like, live in Fulin, I think it was called, uh, which was, which was like, a few hours away from Chongqing, which is, like, this big mega city, and, um, and for him to kind of, like, show up in this small town and, like, try to find a way to, like, live. And I remember funny things, like, you know, like, he was a runner in university, so every morning he would want to wake up and go for a run, but then after a couple months he figured out, like, this it's so polluted that he's actually doing a huge disservice to him, to his body. That's like I had the exact same experience. <laughs> I stopped running. I, I did it for like a month or two. I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, the, the pollution, I think of, of all the things that kind of got to me after 18 years in China, the, the pollution was part of it. But I was so, 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 so lucky I got out before the COVID lockdown. Like, if I had been there through the COVID lockdown, I think I would have lost my mind. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. But back to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, hey, I, I mean, I'm learning so much. It's just... Uh, this is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I did a podcast a couple of weeks ago with a, a, a gentleman who who just asked me questions for an hour. Like, I don't care. Like, we just it's all it's all entertaining. You should do a podcast with Dashan. I'm trying to get him in actually because yeah. he's doing a, he's doing an event in LA this week. What kind of event is that? I wonder if I like because I know a lot of the people who do Chinese events. I don't. Know. Yeah, he's at uh, Caltech, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to get him onto the podcast. He's he's always a little shy around media because I think he's just done so much and been around so much. That uh, he doesn't really like. He, he might. He's much funnier and much more relaxed just having a quiet beer. That's really cool. Yeah, but I'm trying. He's here and we're chatting, so okay. I'm trying to get trying to get him out. I think he's. But I think he's at Caltech on the 27th. There's an event there. Huh. I'm not sure if it's a Chinese event or it's just him because he just does events by himself too, like without like the China connection. But then he does a bunch of big Chinese events, and I'm just thinking like it's October Chinese calendar. Like no, there's nothing really going on. Interesting. Yeah, but he's a wild guy. We imagine. <laughs> That's got stories. Yeah. Um, but, uh, okay, so, I mean, reverse culture shock. So you finish like a year in Beijing. Yeah. You've been to Nanjing. You've been to Shaolin. I didn't get to go to Nanjing because I was doing one of those international cultural shows. Okay. And it was like the biggest one. So I actually had to skip that trip. Mm -hmm. But I, I went to the Shaolin. That's good. Nanjing's lovely. It's like the former capital, right? Yeah, I've never been there. And mm. I, hopefully I'll get to go yeah beautiful beautiful town you got to go back you got to go back but what was so let's get into this reverse culture yeah. shock so so you come back to north america and you're like what the fuck the idea behind reverse culture shock is over a period of uh, a few months you have adapted to a new culture 
and that's kind of become your lifestyle. It's become familiar. You're starting to react more through this cultural lens. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you go back to your home country. Suddenly, those those actions that you're doing, it's like imagine if like um, someone's been holding a, a, a focus bit for you and you're punching and you're hitting that every single day and then that guy disappears and you try to punch and you go into the air and then you're kind of looking around and you're like, wait, what do I, what do I punch at now? Yeah. That's kind of what it's like. And not only that, but then you have made all these connections over in whatever country you've been in. You don't have that support structure that you've been relying on every day, and even more heavily than it back home, probably, because maybe you guys are in the same boat being internationals, or maybe they have just been, you know, locals that have really taken you under their wing and they're helping you out. They're completely gone, like out of your life, with the exception of maybe like instant messaging at that time, like MSN instant messaging. That's going way back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, but you know, it's people are not on that every day and stuff like that. So you don't have any of those people. And then the third factor is all your friends and family back home, you're now like a new person. It's like, you know, I think they say every seven years, every cell in your body turns over and regenerates and you're like technically, physically a completely different person. Yeah, and, and also too, like your your goals and ambitions and everything change. That's, and that's happened now in three months, but you look identical. Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, hey, you want to, uh, welcome to Thanksgiving, I have a turkey leg. And you're like, man, I miss like uh, chow bing or whatever. I don't know if you ever had chow bing. Yeah. It's this like Beijing style. Have you had chow bing? I think I have had chow bing. It's like a, it's a Beijing like street food kind of. So it's kind of hard to find here. And, with pork, right? Uh, It can be with anything. Yeah. It can be, well, so there's like, there's a lot of different types of bing. Bing just means like crepe, pancake kind of. So there's like bing that's more like almost like a like a hand pie where it has like meat in it and you'll just like grill it. Uh, but chow bing is where you take that bing instead of like grilling it, you chop it up and stir fry it like noodles. Oh, that's so it's basically like chow mein, mm -hmm. but the noodles are like thick and a little bit flaky, and uh, you know they put some vegetables in it, put some eggs, some meat, all kinds of stuff. And I'm like everybody's like, what the heck is that? You know, and your life is completely different, but everybody expects you to be the same, and no one understands really what you've been through, and it's kind of, you feel hollow. Completely. So I really I really struggled with that coming back, and to compound that, I had a lot of friends who were upperclassmen when I left, they graduated. Now I'm like, who do I hang out with? Yeah. And I was, I was once again fortunate for the martial arts, because I went right back to the martial arts club. There were a bunch of new members who joined while I was gone, and then we became friends and then that's like okay now i have a new family here you it's funny that you came back from china and and no one really respected the fact that you'd gone through this massive growth it's not it's not that they didn't respect it that's that's also in a way it makes it even harder because they do respect it oh really they do respect it but even with that respect they have no idea yeah that's they it. really don't know and unless unless they've been there and I don't think any of my friends at that time had. And so it was it was it was tough, you know, living on my own. I had moved to a new apartment, a new roommate, and he's not there all the time. And I'm just like watching like Sports Center at ten PM by myself or something on a Friday night. When you should be living abroad in China, like living living your living your best life. Yeah. But it but it, it worked out, you know, and and um so I had like another year and a half at USC and I finished that up and then Around that time, one of my Chinese professors, actually, it was before I studied abroad. He was like, hey, so I heard you're going to China and like, you want to do martial arts. I said, yeah, that's right. And I, I applied to this program. I've been accepted to Peking University. And he said, oh, you know, there's a, there's a scholarship that the Chinese government gives out. And uh, you could apply to a sports university. I, I can help you with your application. And I'm like, well, um, I think I'm going to go to Peking University, you know. And he said, um, can you just drop out of that? And, you know, just go to a sports university. I'm like, I got to finish my bachelor's. What was he going to do? Like, get a kickback for getting you into a sports university? I don't know. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, I think the deal was, so this is a, the Chinese uh, government scholarship program. And I, I actually don't know what, what the status is right now. But at that time, they were really encouraging a lot of study abroad. And I think if USC had students getting accepted into this, you know, it boosts the prestige of USC. Yeah. And so he actually, when I was going to graduate, I said, hey, can I still apply for that? And he's like, yeah, sure. Um, I'll get you the application. And so I said, all right, um, 
let's see if this pans out. And I graduated from USC. I applied to this scholarship and, and I got accepted. Even after you graduated, you weren't even a student anymore. You don't have to be a student. Okay. There was, I ended up having a classmate who was like in her forties, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they accept anybody. And, um, so you went back to Beijing. I went back to Beijing and I went to the sports university that my teacher had been from, that I had been going to every week. It was kind of this weird, like full circle moment where I'm like already familiar with this new university. And it was, it was an unbelievable opportunity. I was studying martial arts every day mm -hmm. with a professional instructor and they took care of all my living expenses and they gave me a cash stipend every month for like That's nice. deals and stuff like that. Yeah. And I didn't have any homework. I didn't have any other responsibilities. We train two hours a day and I can do whatever I want with the rest of my 22 hours. Wow, you were totally free. It was unbelievable. What was it like living in Beijing and being that free? You know, I've always been one, uh, one who perhaps to my detriment, I get so hyper-focused on something that that's all I really care about. Um, you know, I'm not like a partier type of guy. I don't go out to clubs or anything like that. And also this new sports university, I had like a different type of like culture shock. Cause I'd come from USC, great university. I've been to PKU, great university. And this was like 2000 people. It was not on the level of those other two universities that I went to. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a really, really different experience. I was living by myself. It was like the first time I'd ever lived without a roommate. <laughs> and um, yeah, man, I spent a lot of time by myself. I learned how to just be by myself. I would just train. I would, we had classes, you know, Monday through Friday in Wushu. And then I would lift weights after class. And then at night, I'd go back to the building and I'd train by myself for like an hour. And that was pretty much it for me. And then on like Friday night, I like walked to a shopping mall and I have a Dairy Queen blizzard. So that was like my connection back home. I became obsessed with Dairy Queen. The blizzards are good. They're good. And yeah, there was like tons of Dairy Queens in China. So I was more than you think. Yeah, yeah. seriously, like more than like here in some ways. And there's more KFCs than McDonald's. There was a KFC in that same shopping center and they had beef. Yeah. They had beef. And I, I was like completely um, shocked by that. But it was it was a really, really great opportunity. And I had I had talked to one of my acting professors at USC before I left and I said, Listen, I don't know if I should do this because I want to be a professional actor. And part of me is saying, just hit the ground running in LA, you know, just go for it and try to start your career right now. But then I also have this opportunity that I might be able to take advantage of. And he said, Listen, um, which one makes your life story more interesting? You know, in so many words, he basically said that. He said, do you want to do the martial arts? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, okay, if you go and do that for a year, you won't regret it. But if you don't go, you might. For your whole life. Yeah, because you could have taken that opportunity. When else are you going to get that opportunity? And he also said, you might get opportunities as an actor there that you wouldn't get starting out in L.A. because you stand out a lot more there. That was one reason why my photography and writing career took off so fast yeah. in China was because there were so few like foreign journalists that they that newspapers and magazines in the US could really rely on to like have proper journalistic standards in their reporting and at that time especially. Yeah, for sure. I mean, now like most of the people who are working internationally, you know, are local to the country that they're in and they're working for all the various US. But back in the day like it was really helpful to like have a North American person that, you know, had been to New York and met everyone at the, you know, and then could be in Shanghai or Beijing and on call essentially 24 seven. So like, it was funny that the journalism career that I had was completely jump started by the fact I started in China and not here. And my television career, I was so far ahead of people because I started over there versus start trying to start here. Yeah. Cause again, like if you're just out, if you're just out in the wild doing, you know, cool shit people people jump on board like it's just it's it's that it's the it's the doing nothing that just repels people from your energy and like what you're putting out into the world right but if you're if you're actively trying to do stuff and you're actively trying to improve your stuff and you're actively trying to like educate yourself and learn about a place or some people or whatever like that that leads to everything you want in life just like when i told you i just like 
sign up for some talent show just to perform martial arts. I ended up getting all these opportunities at Peking University from that. Yeah. They always say that you're most attractive when you're just doing what you want to do. Yeah. Doing your own thing. And not caring if it's going to fail. Yeah. Yeah. Not caring what you look like, not caring how you're doing, just like doing it because you enjoy it. Yeah. That's why I started this podcast. I love it. I love it. So, so the second time in China, you really learned like how to live alone, how to yeah. train, how to focus on just one thing. Mm-hmm. Well, I got to do other things too. I mean, like as I'm sure you know, as a foreigner in China, you're gonna get just different kinds of opportunities. Like mm-hmm. I did like modeling for some um, photography school and did shoots with them. I did voice recordings for English language textbooks, and, and I got to do some movies too. Mm-hmm. Um, just like <laughs> my martial arts teacher who I had worked with at Peking University. He was still kind of around the sports university. So I ran into him one day. I think it was like my first month there. And he's like, oh, hey, and I heard that you were going to be coming. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's good to see you again. Let's catch up or something. He's like, yeah, okay. And we exchanged phone numbers. And then like two weeks later, he calls me and he says, hey, do you want to be in a movie with Jet Li? Absolutely. fucking Luli. I'm like... Um, what do I got to do? He's like, well, you just uh, audition. I know I know someone who will take us to the audition. I said, great, when is it? He's like, yeah, it's right now. In the third act, Jet Li is going to slice you in half. <laughs> uh, well, actually, it turned out that he ended up, I think he dropped out of the project or something, so they replaced him with uh, some other actors who, who actually were very popular actors in China. And um, yeah, I went through this whole audition process for this movie. We met <laughs> in his office right across the street from the bird's nest. Right, of course. And, of course, because, like, that's, like, the prestigious place to have your office at that time. Probably still now, I would imagine. Is the business still there? I guess it would be, yeah. I think all that stuff's still there. Like, I I went to a... That was in 2012, and I went to the Beijing Television Chinese New Year Gala that was in the water cube. Oh, that was cool. I've never been in there. Yeah, it was was really nice. I don't Mm. don't think they had water anymore at that time we went in. Uh, Because they were... It was, like, a stage, and they were doing all kinds of performances. That's wild. Huh? But uh, I ended up getting the part. My callback audition was in front of Sam Hung. Do you know who Sam Hung is? Don't know Sam. He's like this absolutely legendary martial arts actor and director in China. He was Jackie Chan's opera brother. Oh, shit. And so there were three like stars from this Peking Opera School that they all learned at. The three main dudes who came out starring in movies were Jackie Chan, Sam Hung, and Yuan Biao. And they made movies together. I think they were the three lucky stars or something. Yeah, it was like a take on the Three Stooges, but it was all martial arts or something like that. Pretty much like that. So they made a lot of movies together, and Sam Hung did a lot of stuff on his own. He was doing fight coordinating. He was directing. He was producing. And then he even got a show in uh, the United States. I think it was called Martial Law. That's what it was called. Oh, I remember that show. Yeah, Yeah, he was the star of that show. I think it ran for like two or three seasons. And um, he was the action director on this movie, so I had to audition in front of him on set with, like, five other white guys. And it was just the craziest experience, and they, they chose me. I mean, I got super lucky. But did the other guys, the other white guys that were auditioning, did they have the martial arts experience that you'd had? I don't remember. Uh, they had some kind of experience. Um, I think it was more like kickboxing stuff. Mm-hmm. And I did more of the, you know, wushu. I did some weapons work. And then they didn't tell me anything. But later on, I found out in the fight scene I ended up doing, it was a weapons fight. It was with staffs. So maybe that helped me that I had familiarity with the weapons. It's funny that they don't even tell you that. I mean, a lot of, I I don't know what it's like now, but throughout history, Mm -hmm. and at least up until 2012, they don't really have scripts. Yeah. They have an outline. And then you show up on set and they're like, uh, okay, so say this. It's a little messy. Yeah. It's just very improvisational. And I think, once again, basing my experience off of that time period, the labor cost was so cheap. They can just shoot and shoot, you know, where like a, a low budget movie here might shoot for 15 or 16 days. And there they're like, yeah, two months for the same budget, maybe even a lesser budget. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know the, the, the costs have definitely risen since then. I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, we had background actors on that film that were like volunteers. I asked that like, <laughs> they picked them up like day work. Yeah, they picked me up at my university, and then we lived next to this like film university, and they drove, you know, this van. We're all in a van. They drove out front. There were some guys on the curb. And they're like, "Uh, we need five. And some dudes got in, and uh, then we went to set, which is like two hours outside of Beijing. 
And then at night, I was like talking to everybody and I was like, they were asking me about this and that. And I don't remember how it came up. They must have volunteered because I would never ask what their rate is, you know. Mm. But one of the guys is like, yeah, I'm not even being paid for this, but it's a great opportunity, you know, just to, just to be here, to learn and, uh, you know, get dinner. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot of day laborers hanging out on the corners everywhere. Yeah, yeah, even even for films, it, you know, at, at, at that time we did that project. So that was a great experience. And then people that I met on that film uh, ended up calling me to work together on another kung fu film, too. So it was, I don't know, man, I just, I've always been, like, chasing. I don't know, do you ever have an experience in your life where you're like, this was, like, a character arc, and it just kind of worked out in this way, and you're like, cool, how do I uh, do this again doing something else? Has that happened to you? Just your podcast or your show or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's like a, you have to constantly kind of like reinvent yourself, right? Like, yeah. So you know, if you have a really good run doing something you love, eventually it's going to come to an end, and then you have to kind of figure out how to like ramp up and and get something going again, right? Get some juice, yeah. get yeah. some real momentum, because like everything is momentum based. So you know, for me, you know, I I got into China at a young age. Um, started doing the journalism work, started winning some awards and everything like that. Um, and then that arc kind of ended around 2010, 2011, but then I started making TV and that was a really great arc that I was on until like COVID, like March, 2020. And then that kind of stopped. Yeah, been... Right. In terms of the, the, the stuff you were doing, yeah. you're like, well, I'm not going to do that right now. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine like traveling 300 days a year globally and then, and then not? No, I can't. <laughs> Give me, give me a little bit of time. I'll picture. Yeah, there's a bottle of whiskey outside for us after if you really want to get into it. Um, no, but it was crazy. Like, I remember <clears throat> in uh, in one year, I did like 40-plus speaking engagements. I filmed eight episodes of Extreme Treks, which is where we were traveling all around the world. For those. So those were 46 minutes each. So we filmed in like Russia, Iceland, Laos, Papua New Guinea, Bolivia, Argentina, Jordan, and Uganda. How long did it take to film one episode? That was two weeks. So we we would spend a ton of time in the field because we we just refused to fake shit. Like if I'm going to walk 150 miles across a desert, we're walking 150 fucking miles. That's across. the point of the show. Yeah, and it took sometimes it takes 10, 12, 14 days. So like we just we just embraced it and um, and spent a lot of time in the field. We loved it. I had a really great relationship with my guys. My camera guys, uh, Chad and Jesse at that time. So it was great. But in one year, you can imagine, I did 40 speaking events, uh, eight episodes, which was two weeks on, two weeks off. And then I also did a 74-day motorcycle series in Canada with uh, Tourism Canada. So like that was by 74 days. Like the ride was 74 days? Yeah. The, f the film production was 74 days. We, okay. did, we did like about 18,000 miles all across Canada, including the Arctic, to just kind of show off all the provinces and territories and all the things. That's really cool. It, it was an epic... You know, it's funny, like I left Canada at a pretty young age and I never really got to like explore Canada. So when that opportunity came, I was super excited because now I'm going to get to ride a motorcycle and see like everything in my country. And, but that was, that, but that was life. Like I was like totally normal. So like, yeah, I would go out into the desert or on the side of a mountain and film for two weeks. Then I'd come back, do one or two speaking events and then work on the Canadian motorcycle thing. And I go back out, do another mountain, come back, work on the Canadian motorcycle thing. And then I would have to do the Canadian motorcycle thing. And then I'm doing the Canadian motorcycle thing every day, every night. I'm coming back, working on where's the next mountain for the extreme treks to climb. So I was just constantly producing like two or three shows all the time. And that was fantastic. And I rode that all the way up until about March 2020. And then it's been just quiet. Like then COVID hit. Then there was an actor strike, writer strike. And now like people are people who have been working in this town for like 20 years still haven't figured out like what's happening and yeah. like what's going to what 2025 will look like and whether we're all going to get back to work or not because there's yeah there's a ton of people in this town who are sag sag you know members and everything like that who are just not working it's crazy yeah yeah definitely well that's why podcasts like this right You're creating your own content your own opportunities opportunities but the, the thing for me is um is like i came here from dubai uh, i was living in dubai after china and then uh, which is a wild journey in its own right it's like it but but like I just came here and I didn't have any, and I didn't have any friends. So then I was like, well, how do I meet cool people? And then how do I, you know, also network at the same time? And I was like, well, I got to start a podcast because then I'll, you know, like I've, you're number 102. So congratulations. Oh. But now I have 102 
you know, friends that I've at least spent two or three hours chatting with and like, and you know, you can call on them and we, yeah, yeah and it's great. Like I'm still in touch with a bunch of them. Like one guy I go shooting with, we'd go to the shooting range. Um, another guy, like I train with, go to the gym. Um, you know, another guy I go out for dinner with every now and then. Like, it's just, it's, it's a nice way to like build a community around you and what you've done. And then again, cause I've done all these shows and stuff, like people want to come meet me and say hi. So it's, it's not that hard getting people to come into the studio and, and, and catch up. It's very ingenious. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not bad. I mean, like if you don't know anyone, the best way to know people is to sit down with them like this. For sure. I mean, it's, yeah, the type of format, you're going to learn so much so, and then they'll get to know you too. Yeah. And you never know what you'll connect on, like living in China. And, and, or what creative pursuits you might be able to, you know, work on together at some yeah. stage. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. And it, you know, like if you write a producer and say like, Hey, I make TV shows, I'd like to meet you. Mm -hmm. They'll be like, oh, I'm busy. Like, but if you're like, they won't, they'll be like, you'll never hear back. But then that's, that was silence. I was trying to take a moment of silence because you'll never hear back. That's the response. Um, but if you say like, Hey, I've made 50 hours of TV shows all around the world on five continents and you're an amazing producer and I'd love you, you know, to come. Yeah. And they just say yes. I like that. Yeah. So I need to start the uh, Sky Liam China Entertainment Podcast. I'm a veteran of the Chinese film industry now. Let's talk about film today. Just talk about anything. Like, yeah. on, honestly, like, just tap into whatever is the spec. Like, I didn't even know you went to China. We just did, like, an hour plus on China. And I didn't even know you went to China until you arrived. That's crazy, man. And it's like, you know, and that was, it feels like another life in a way. Because I was in China. I did movies there. I was comp I competed there, too. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back to the States, after that year was up, after the scholarship was up, I came back and I kept competing. Like my goal, at some point, I just adopted this goal that I wanted to be a champion. And I, I don't know, maybe it was like being a USC, you see all these um, you know, guys walking by you and then the next semester, they're out of college and in the NFL, or they're in the NBA. Yeah. It was amazing. It's fucked up, isn't it? No, I think it's incredible. I mean, it's it's such a unique experience because college sports are not like that in most other countries. No other. Or country. you can go to class, or you can sit in the dining hall next to, uh, I think it was at that time like the number seven NBA draft pick. Mm -hmm. Number two, my freshman year, we had the number two NBA draft pick. I think it's you know around campus, and then the next year the number seven draft pick, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and then plus, when you watch all these martial arts movies in that era. All these guys, the, the the pathway used to be you'd be a champion in something and then you kind of get scouted and you end up in some movie. So all my idols were like, you know, martial arts champions. And I. It's a good way to get your name out. It, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's quite the same anymore. I think MMA has supplanted that more so over the traditional martial arts, which were really big in the 60s, 70s, 80s. You had Chuck Norris. He was a champion. Oh, Chuck, wow. Uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme was a champion in Europe. You had Dolph Lundgren, I'm sure you're, you know him, right? Mm -hmm. He was a European champion as well. In, in Kung Kyokushin. Kyo oh, really? Karate. Are you familiar with Kyokushin Karate? I'm not. I would like Kyokushin, man. I don't know. Something about your vibe. Yeah. Uh, Kyokushin Karate is a style that's very focused on sparring. It's full contact sparring, except for punches to the face. You can kick to the face. You can punch to the body. You can't punch to the face. I think I'd rather be punched in the face than kicked in the face, isn't that? Well, the the philosophy is it's much harder to execute a kick to someone's face. If you punch to the face, you're just going to have two guys punching each other in the face for, you know, all four rounds. Right. But you had to be really good, actually, to kick someone in the face successfully. Mm -hmm. uh, that's good to know. Well, the part that I didn't mention is they use zero protective gear. Yeah, that's what you expect, right? I mean, they don't use gloves. They don't use, I don't think they use cups. They don't use foot pads or anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, they just wear their geese, and it's it's really tough. Like I couldn't do that style, to be honest. But yeah, he was a he was a full contact champion in that style. I played rugby for like two decades. Like I used to run full speed at people with no well, padding okay. on. So that's I, why you should do shit. <laughs> <laughs> a, a retired rugby player. You know what's crazy about rugby though is that, uh, from what I've heard, mm -hmm. a lot fewer concussions than American football. Yeah, because people don't lead with their head, which is I know it's it's weird. Like. They keep thinking, well, the better the helmet, the more we could protect people and actually just makes guys like smash their heads into people. Yeah. If you want to get rid of concussions in the NFL, just get people to not wear helmets. They're starting that. They have this new thing called a guardian cap. Have you seen it? Yeah. It's like a big bubble on their head. Yeah. And apparently it's really helpful, but it looks like kind of goofy. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very slowly making its way into practices. And 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the great thing about rugby is it's it's mostly arm tackles. So like, oh. you get a, you get a few big fucking beefy guys out there that like, that, th that drop a shoulder every now and then, and that's becoming more common actually now that players have like shoulder pads. I don't know if you've noticed this. But like 25 years ago or whatever, we just wore like our T-shirts. Yeah, that's why I always see like yeah. polo shirts, right? Yeah, and then, you know, if I'm wearing a polo shirt and you're wearing a polo shirt, I'm not dropping my shoulder or using my head to slow you down. So, yeah. so what you do is you kind of wrap your hands around the guy's waist and then you drop to the feet and then you hold on to the feet and mm -hmm. then boom, right? Every time. Like you don't have to, you don't have to send an earthquake through his family village, you know, uh, you know, uh, around the world yeah. every time you hit someone, right? Like, you just got to bring them down, recycle the ball. Bring them down, recycle the ball. Like, that's that's rugby. But now um, now with all the padding, it's getting insane. I would love to see the NFL just get rid of, like, a ton of fucking padding and let them go a little bit a little bit more freelance on the, uh, I don't know, just, just the, the helmet hitting is too much. Something's going to evolve at some point, but I, I don't know what it's going to be. Um, so, so okay. yeah, so at that time, you know, I said, well, I want to be a champion. I got that's what I thought the first time when I went to Peking University and I was there for like three and a half months and I came back and I really I, I definitely improved but I was not good enough to win really anything I think like that was my junior year senior year like right after I graduated a month after I graduated I competed in a tournament in LA and I won a bronze medal and that was like the first real like legitimate kind of medal I won in a martial arts tournament. I'm like, wow. So I'm getting better, mm -hmm. but you know, that's, I, I was shooting for bronze. Like I was of that opinion that it's like gold or nothing. Sure. Right. Um, so, so I went back to China, I spent an entire year training there and I come back to LA, start competing in my first like two tournaments. I lose again. I, I made it to the grand champion round. So that the, the setup is you have all your different divisions by belt level, the white belts, gold, yellow, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's the black belt division. And so you compete in forms. I was mostly doing a lot of forms. And you can compete in a traditional form, like a Shaolin Kung Fu. Or you can compete with a modern form, contemporary form, like Wushu. Mm -hmm. uh, you compete in weapons. They might have a short weapon category, long weapon category. Sometimes they have musical weapons where you choreograph it to a piece of music. All these different divisions... All the first place black belt winners of all those divisions I just named, at the end, like, all enter, one is left standing, you know? You have to compete against all the champions from every division, and you are crowned the grand champion. That's wild. All I cared about was winning grand championships, and so I made it to the grand champion round, and I was just, like, messing stuff up. And I talked to my coach here in L.A., who actually was a former member of the Beijing Wushu team, and he said, listen... When you are out there competing, you're on that mat, this is your time, okay? The judges are forced to watch you. They're not going to watch anybody else. No one else can come onto the mat. Only you can. It's yours. So just enjoy it. Just do whatever you want. And before I was competing, I was always trying to block everything out. You know, nothing exists. It's just me. And it, it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. So when he told me that, I went out and in the grand championship round, before I stepped onto the mat, I looked into the stands, I looked at every single person sitting there and said, okay, I'm gonna have fun and I'm gonna show them something. You're, you're an entertainer. I said, I'm gonna show them something that they haven't seen before, you know, which is me doing this form, mm -hmm. a six foot two guy doing wushu. And I did it and I won my first grand championship. Oh, nice. And then I kind of ran off a little mini streak and I was kind of like getting this name in like the California martial arts scene. Like you see a lot of the same judges and stuff, a lot of the same competitors. And I won like multiple grand championships at these different tournaments. And then I said, okay, I'll take like a, an off season for a few months. I'm going to come back better. And I'm going to win big tournaments, even bigger ones, mm -hmm. national, international tournaments. And I came and I totally fizzled out. And I was really training as hard as I could to get to that next level. And I just, man, I felt like I was totally hitting a wall. I wasn't winning like anything. And I, I said, I, I can't take this anymore. I don't even like this anymore. Mm -hmm. But I had already registered for like two more tournaments. And I, at this point, I knew these people who were promoting the tournaments, you know. They were like owners of various martial arts schools and stuff. You didn't want to let them down. Yeah, exactly. They're like, hey, I'll see you at my tournament. You're coming in May, right? How dangerous is it to go to into a tournament unmotivated? Well, um, that's a good, that's a good question. 
can you fake it till you make it if you're not feeling it? Or, or, or can you like really get hurt? Well, this is what happened. So I said, I already paid for the registration fees. I'll just show up and whatever, okay? And I said, I was supposed to compete in a, a empty hand forms division and a weapons division. And I'm like, I don't even care. I don't even feel like doing the weapons. I'll just do the form mm -hmm. and that's it. I did the form and it was like, also, like the most stacked field, like every guy from SoCal came out to that one tournament. And it was just like a medium sized tournament. It wasn't even the big tournament. But I ended up winning the grand championship there with a traditional Shaolin form. So I was competing against guys who were doing all these crazy flips and twists and stuff and musical forms and everything. And I just did like a form I learned from the Shaolin monks. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention that. Uh, during my winter break, when I was living in Beijing, I went and I trained this like Shaolin village for her. I did my own American Shaolin. Yeah, yeah. I did it, Matt. <laughs> I, I lived there for a month and I trained at this school run by these former monks. That's epic. So I, I did this traditional Buddhist form and I, I beat all these incredible martial artists. And I'm like, whoa, this is, this is insane. And the next tournament coming up was the Long Beach International Karate Championships, which is where... The most, like, the biggest claim to fame is Bruce Lee demonstrated there in the 60s. He was seen by all these professionals, and he got the role of Cato on the Green Hornet. Oh, wow. So it launched his entire career in Hollywood. And then also, like, that same year, Chuck Norris won the Grand Championship. And throughout the years, like, every major martial artist pretty much made a stop through Long Beach and, like, the most famous guys, like Billy Blanks. You remember Tybo? I remember Tybo. The founder, Billy Blanks, was like a very decorated martial arts champion. He won the Long Beach Grand Champion. And so I'm like, well, I got to give it a shot, you know. And it was the 50th anniversary of the Long Beach Grand Championship. So I went there. And once again, I was just like, I already paid whatever. I'll just do it. And I won the Grand Champion. You took, the pr you took all the pressure off yourself. I did. Mm. And, but it wasn't just that, though, because that was a huge aspect. The other aspect was because I did the work for years and years. I'm like, you can't just go out and do whatever. You have to do all that work, but sometimes that work adds expectation. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. Like, I played basketball my, my whole life, basically, from, like, the age of 5 to the age of 22. And I would put in the work all week, right? So you play Friday, Saturday normally. Like, you train Monday to Monday to Thursday. And, and I would put in the hard work and get everything done. And then when it came to game time, I was just like, well... I've done all the fucking work, and if it's not gonna if it's not gonna happen for me tonight, I it's not gonna happen. But I'm just gonna go out there and try to shoot the lights out and try to, you know, yeah. just try to play my game. But if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But at least I put in all the fucking work, and that like really just took all the pressure off me, um, because it was like no one can take what I did from Monday to Thursday away from me. Totally. And then whatever happens in the game is kind of out of my control. Like I just got to go out and and just use what we learned in the week, and then and then figure it out. And and it just took so much pressure off me. And then I just started to play really loose and really relaxed. And it really helped my game. That was like, in my high school days, I kind of figured that out. And, I, and then I just became like way more loose, way more relaxed, made way less mistakes and played a lot better. And you did that with your photography too. You just loved photography. You went on, just did it. And then it led to all these opportunities. Yeah. It's just... I think your superpower is taking an experience and synthesizing a lesson. Trying. And also too, like, not necessarily needing to win, like just doing something for the sake of doing it, like yeah. and just trying to educate yourself along the way, I think. I think and, and, and again, building to this life story that is your life. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like if we all live to a ripe old age of 90 and you happen to have, you know, someone write an autobiography about you someday, like you want it to be full of fucking cool shit. And that cool shit translates across everything you're going to do in your career, in business, in life. Like you just, you're going to get to meet more interesting people. You're going to get to, you know, much more interesting opportunities. And, and, you know, you just kind of have to keep adding cool shit to your resume. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's what we can all hope for. Well, you don't hope. Try, try, but it's okay. So you get back from fucking Shaolin, Beijing, yeah. the whole thing. You're back here. You're winning martial arts tournaments. Like, like they're going out of style. And then, and then what? So then I always had this plan, which was like, I was going to give myself about like two years to really compete, try to win as many grand championships as possible, which, you know, when I formed this plan, I had won zero. And then hopefully within those two years, right, I can accomplish some of these goals and then move on to really focusing on acting. So the, so the martial arts and stuff was a total stepping stone. Um, it was 
you loved it, but it was leading you to acting? It was kind of, they were almost like parallel roads, you know? And to be honest, they haven't intersected that much, mm -hmm. surprisingly. Um, I did mention that I did a couple kung fu movies in China. That was my first professional experience in a film. But since then, I did um, I did like a like a, some kind of cell phone commercial where I was fighting some guys, mm -hmm. and then I made this big short film. Actually, I just released like a couple months ago. That was kind of my my big push. Like, okay, let's get martial arts back into my life, back into my filmmaking, really, mm -hmm. and uh, and go for it with that. There's a there's a stunt there's a stunt man studio in Long Beach. Really, it's called like two. Two something something I, I can't remember, but Dave, the guy who was in here a couple uh, weeks ago, oh, yeah. he was telling me about. It. So like all the John Wick movies and everything like that, they all pull their stunt oh, people yeah. from. No, I used to train. To... Oh, did you? What was it called? Uh, it's called Eighty Seven Eleven. Eighty Seven Eleven. That's it. Yeah. It's um. It's not Long Beach. It's in Inglewood. Okay. So I used to. Okay, I threw um. So. Yeah, I threw a friend in college. Actually, he went to a different college, but I had met him through like wushu stuff. Mm -hmm. And he's like, hey, I started training with his new instructor. Um, he's from the Beijing Wushu team. I mentioned him already. Uh, you, should, you should check him out. He trains in Inglewood. And I didn't have a car, so I would take the bus Sunday nights to Inglewood. It wasn't that bad taking the bus there like 5, you know, busing home at 10 p.m., transferring mm. by yourself on a corner in Inglewood. That was, you know. A little dodgy. It made you very aware of your surroundings. Mm. But um, I started training with him, I think, I think junior or senior year of college. And it turned out that he was a member of this stunt team. Mm -hmm. And he had just come from Houston. He was this wushu guy. And I think they wanted more wushu. And so he didn't have a, he wanted to make extra money teaching Kung Fu, but he didn't have a studio. So they would let him teach there like Sunday nights because no one else was using it. So I used to train there with him. And then I went off to China. I trained, I came back. By the time I came back, he had opened up a studio in Walnut, which is way out in the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, I don't even I don't even know where that is. Oh well, we'll get you introduced. We'll get you some chow bing. That's the only place you can find a real chow bing. That's um, yeah, he had a studio there, and so I trained there during the week. And then on Sundays we do this thing at the the John Wick studio. And actually, the the guy who founded that studio he had this idea to make John Wick. And like I remember someone telling me like, hey, so we're gonna shoot this video uh, next weekend for John Wick. And I'm like, what is John Wick? I had no idea what this was. Was this Chad the director? It wasn't Chad. Uh, it was one of my classmates. And then my coach wanted to show some choreo to Chad. So we did his video for him. He like choreographed this whole fight scene. We dressed up in suits mm -hmm. and we shot this video and then he showed it to Chad. And then, I mean, I wasn't in the movie, but they ended up doing a lot of these fights for the movie. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. And then kind of, I ended up, we, I hadn't spoken to him in a while. Um, didn't end up really working together. He went to China and did some movies there, and then he um, he worked on the Deadpool movies and stuff. And so he's been doing a lot of a lot of different things. But I I was yeah training there every week, and I got to meet some of those people. I met like Chad like super briefly. I saw Keanu in there for a meeting, and this was all before John Wick actually happened. Uh, and I think they got that title because like the tagline was, "Don't set him off." Yeah, that's where they came up with that name, John Wick, and now it's so cool that that name in itself is almost—it's a brand. It is, yeah, and they're they're creating spinoffs of it too now. They just did the ballerina with An Anna de Armas, and mm -hmm. uh, and they're talking about doing some kind of like prequel to John Wick, like the story about how he completed that unbelievable assignment that bought him his freedom, so well, that he could. That it would be. <laughs> yeah, so I I was not working with some of those guys, mostly just training together. I think we did. Like two short films too, um, but it was mostly a lot of training, and they got, they are the best in the world at what they do. And I learned that it's very different competing in martial arts than like doing the falls and all the stuff that they do. It's it's really a great challenge. Yeah, no, I, I believe it. it must be a totally different headspace, like competing, trying to beat someone, and then versus like trying to execute some performance and then landing and making sure everyone's not hurt. It's a different, it's its own style. Yeah. You know, there's wushu, there's taekwondo, there's like this kind of stunt style. Mm -hmm. And um, so some of the stuff, if you do a traditional martial arts, you can use some of that, but some of it is like a different style that you have to learn. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a very challenging style, especially the bigger and bigger you get. I mean, physically, mm -hmm. um, stature wise, it can be more challenging. And there are some taller guys who are really, really good at it, but I think it's a little more challenging. That's wild. Yeah, uh, Dave was telling me um, 
a couple of weeks ago that he was uh, he was one of the stunt actors that had to do the fall down the stairs in in John Wick uh, Part Four, and he was doing those falls, and he said it was just unbelievable. And he's a you know he's in his forties, I'm in my forties. Like I can tell, like that's not something I would want to do. Like you know in one like and they filmed at night, right? So you you, yeah. you, you get a call you get a call sheet. You know you got to be ready to go at 10 p.m. and then you finish at 5 a.m. and all you're doing is just falling down these fucking steps, getting your shit kicked out of you. Yeah. And he he was he just loved it though, and I was just like, man, I can't. I, I'm not wired like that, but he he just said it was just unbelievable. That's great. Yeah. You have to be really really tough, <laughs> but you also have to be extremely physically aware, and you have to have both. You can't just be a great athlete and say, oh, I'm going to do this stunt, like you'll hurt yourself. But you can't just be tough and say, I'm going to do this stunt, you'll hurt yourself. Yeah. And so I mean, if I were to, I couldn't do it the way they did it. So I just started to, and I realized that because I was training with those guys, and I'm like, wow, they're incredible. If if I was to do a fight scene, which I've done fight scenes, you know, and I had to do this kick and a spinny kick and a jump kick, I can do all that, and I can do it pretty well. Mm -hmm. But to do that kind of stuff, I, I'm, I'm not built for that, I mm -hmm. think. just it, it looks like it hurts. It do, oh, it does hurt. It does hurt. And they'll tell you that, you know, and that's why I said that's where the toughness comes in. Yeah. Um, so after the competing and after training with those guys and realizing, like, I can't do it the way they can do it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I really started focusing that same competitive energy into, like, acting to the point where, like, I would be doing, like, a six-hour acting class, and I'd get there an hour early. Mm -hmm. I'd get there early, and I'd sit by myself in this room and just, like, look at the play. And, no, it, it was, at that time, I, I felt like it was... Good. Well, you're bringing that same intensity. Yeah, exactly. The, the thing about acting, though, like, when you're doing a martial arts competition, for example... You know, you got your adrenaline flowing through you, which I'm sure you have when you're doing an audition. I've never aud auditioned for anything, but I'm, I can imagine it's like a little bit stressful, a little bit exciting, a little bit tense. But when you're doing like martial arts, there's such a uh, there's such a clear path. Like it's either like you win or you don't win, mm -hmm. right? But like with acting, it's so much more emotional. It's it's so much more, you know, of um, it's also an art form, but a little bit different, right? But there's there's no like there's no moment where you win like maybe you win the part but then you also have to now make a movie or make a tv show and be directed by someone else so it's kind of like not so it just feels like you're on this journey and it's really hard and it's full of ups and downs and you never really win like like yeah, like there's no like end where you raise your hand and like yeah, yeah. yeah it's very very experiential i mean and when people say acting right you can mean the craft which is absolutely an art form. Yeah. And then you can also mean the profession. And that's very different, right? So if you're speaking about the art form, it's really like the journey is the destination kind of thing where you, you can go to an acting class and you do a scene and you feel really good about that scene. You feel great about your work. And that it's it's a total rush, man. It's, it's the same as like winning a, a championship or something. And you can be the best actor in that class. You could be one of the best actors in the state of California for all anybody knows, right? But you might not have success in the profession. And you have to also figure out how to be successful in that lane, which is, it's not intuitive for a lot of artists. No, and I think you've really described that well. Like, I've never heard it really described that that nicely before. Like, like acting is an art form and then acting is a profession. And those are two completely different lanes. And yeah. And if you're good at one of them, it doesn't mean you're good at the other. Not necessarily. And you have to really, I think, you have to embrace the fact that the profession entails a lot of other things. It, and it, it depends, too, because people will say, hey, man, uh, you should grow your social media. It's going to give you a better chance. It very well may. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have to do any of that. I had 3 a.m. callbacks with Harvey Weinstein, and I was taken care of. There you go, dude. Well, yeah, I had some guys say, hey, want to be in a movie with Jet Li? And, you know, I, well, I, well, I wasn't because he dropped out of the film, but I was in a movie. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that could be the case for some people, but I also have seen people and not to listen, if you love doing it, do it right. But some people post a lot and they don't have a lot of followers and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that unless, unless you hate it, <laughs> and then there might be something wrong with it for you. Um, but it might be, you did your television shows, you know, or it might be your professional at former professional athlete, current professional athlete. Uh, it could be, anything. it could be you, uh, you know, stopped a mugger and it went viral and then someone wants to sign you, right? Who knows? Mm -hmm. And that can get you a foothold in the profession. And then hopefully, if you've been also studying the art form, you can marry those two. But it's, like you said, it's really, um, it's not so cut and dry, you know? It's not so predictable. So you have to study the craft. 
And if you're going to do it for the rest of your life, if you want to do it as a profession, you have to love the craft. Otherwise, I mean, why bother? Yeah. Um, but you have to figure out that professional side. And, and even to this day, that's still been a challenge for me. And I've been fortunate to work in, in films, not only in China here, you know, but as you mentioned, in this climate that we're in, it's still a process. Mm -hmm. It still hasn't really figured out where it's heading yet. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that all the time. Like I have these conversations every day, like trying to raise money to do some things at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Want to do more extreme treks and tough rides. My two, two of my series that I make. And yeah, it's just brutal trying to chat with people. And these are like buttons that I could have easily pressed in like 2018, 2019. Yeah, yeah. totally. I mean, I guess you have to, <laughs> it's hard to figure out the industry when the industry is figuring out itself. That's a really good way to describe it. Yeah, and I think, I think for the first time in like a decade or more, like there's real change going on. Which overall I think is good. And I'm encouraged by every time there's a film that comes out and it's a film that people like, maybe you see it and you like it, and then the film does well. That's super encouraging. Like, listen, guys, this is still happening. Everybody in the industry, you know, you make something that the people who made it, maybe they were really passionate about it. Uh, the story speaks to a lot of people and then it'll make money. You know, yeah. people will watch it. That's, that's encouraging, but it's kind of like, I think people are still skittish about how and when to invest in that kind of stuff. For sure, yeah. 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 And, and you know, not knowing whether the streaming partner is going to take it or whether you want to try to do a theatrical release and what the risks are there. Yeah. And understanding, like, not every movie is made for a theatrical release these days, you know? Like, back in the day, that's all there was, right? And now it's, yeah, people are kind of flipping coins, not knowing, you know, to sell, try to sell it to Netflix or try to sell it to, like, Warner Brothers or Universal or whatever. So it's it's super strange these days and i've and i've used this platform to talk about this for months now and um almost a year and it's been um and it, it's just it doesn't matter what level you talk to people at whether they're crew whether they're talent whether they're producing directing or whatever everyone is just kind of baffled that's a good point yeah that same professor who told me you know if you don't do it you might regret it he also said in our class that if you can think of anything else that you might enjoy besides acting do that stuff yeah because it's just so hard it's so hard but then i felt like you know the opposite of that must also be true which is if you really love acting you have to do it mm -hmm. you have to do it and you have to look and say okay i know i love acting but what else do i love or that i'm interested in that i can marry with this maybe it's martial arts maybe it's for me also writing mm -hmm. which is also one of my strongest subjects in school and okay, so now since the pandemic, I've been writing screenplays, like because you have to sow all these different seeds. Yeah, one of one of my friends that I also did a podcast with here, he was actually a actor in, in the West End in London, um, and then when he moved out here, he just gravitated to writing because he loved writing. So here you've got this person, you know, this actor who uh, and dancer. I mean, he did he had an amazing run in in the West End for a few years, but then when he came out here, he's just like I, I kind of feel like writing now, and he's and he's had a few successful screenplays you know, optioned and picked up and stuff like that. And, and he kind of just totally changed, but it's still like that. It's still that same like creative muscle. Oh, absolutely. And I think each art form helps uh, with the other, you know, because mm -hmm. if you're an actor and you start writing, you stay, listen, you still have to study writing, I believe, you know, if you're not taking classes, then you're reading screenplay books, you're breaking down films about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But the dialogue and the motivation of the character is going to come to you not only more intuitively, but more um, viscerally, mm -hmm. you know, to really infuse that into a screenplay. Whereas when you're a writer, now you pick up a screenplay, maybe you have an audition, you're like, oh, great, I know what I'm trying to say in this scene that makes the story go. Yeah. And so then, okay, great. If I can convey this with my aura, with my word, you know, because I can say to you, uh, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. Or I can say to you, have to go to the bathroom and it's like we have a different relationship yeah and so which one do i need to say in my audition right for for the story in a global sense um writing can really help with that aspect of your act absolutely so what are you doing now like you've had you've been on this fucking wild <laughs> wild journey what are you up to these days yeah well acting whenever whenever they let me um including in my own projects you know i mentioned i did a short film that i came out with and I'm right now starting to write a new short film that I'm hoping to shoot at the beginning of next year. I'm really excited for it. Yeah. 
Uh, I write my own screenplays, which, you know, I've had some very productive meetings on, but I haven't sold a feature script yet. I, I like had about four short films produced, which has been a great experience. That's wild. Congratulations. Thank you. And that has been over the last few years, actually starting during COVID because like they had these uh, programs that if you were able to develop a short film, you could get like a grant for it, you know, various different artist grants. So I started with that, and then I was able to work with some other people, get funded through a few uh, other various means to make these short films. Mm -hmm. But I really love feature films, so that is like a huge goal of mine, right, is to sell a uh, feature film script. And some of them I want to act in, and some of them I don't feel the need to act in as much. I just want to see the story told. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's um, a story where people don't look like me, right? And I still want to see those movies. Um, yeah. So I write, I act, but... I started emceeing live events. Uh, this was after I got back the second time from China. Like, actually, I acted on some Chinese television series that was filming here. Mm -hmm. um, and I made friends with the casting director. And a few months later, he emailed me and said, Hey, are you interested at all in emceeing this Chinese New Year's gala? Well, those are fun. Yeah. I said, Does it pay? Mm -hmm. And he's like, Yeah, I think so. I said, So I said, I'm interested. And I did this event, and people are like, oh my goodness, like this guy speaks Chinese. So, this is the Dashan Path. It's the Dashan Path. It's like my own simulacrum of the Southern California Dashan Path. Yeah. So, everyone's like, oh, cool. Can I add your WeChat? Can I add your WeChat? WeChat being like the Chinese WhatsApp, um, which is completely ubiquitous with like, I would say 99% of Chinese people on planet Earth. Yeah. And it's way better than anything we've got here. It is because you can, you can like, it's Apple Pay plus. Uh, WeChat plus Instagram, basically. Plus banking, plus tickets, air yeah. tickets, train tickets, hotels, yeah. everything. Uber, it's like a it's a taxi app, it's everything. It's like a super app. Yeah, so if you want to do business, you know, in the Chinese community, you have to have WeChat. So after every event that I started doing, people will say, oh, cool. can I add your WeChat? Because uh, I have an event in a couple of months and I, th I might want you to host. So I started just like by word of mouth building this like side hustle. Of That's great. Hosting these events, man. And it was all kinds of like, I've hosted beauty pageants, I've hosted film festivals, I've hosted kids' talent shows, I've hosted corporate galas, clean energy uh, uh, exhibitions. Like, I started going to Vegas and doing, like, conferences there. That's wild. It's been, yeah, it's been incredible. Mostly in L.A. and Orange County and sometimes Vegas, sometimes San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that definitely keeps me occupied. No, that's a, that's a, it's wild. Like, you never know, again, like, once you kind of go off on these journeys and try to have these experiences, you never know where it's going to come back to you, like financially, like so that you can pay your rent and like li yeah. live life. Like, yeah, because you can't just go off and have all these experiences all the time unless you're like a trust fund kid and your parents did something dodgy a long time <laughs> ago and you happen to have a lot of money now. No, people make money legitimately. I'm just joking. But but like, you know, it's funny, like you go and try to do all these cool things, but then trying to find out where the revenue stream is is always important. Oh yeah, and you know, I I just got I got lucky in that sense. Although at the beginning I did some like events for free, you know, the whole exposure thing, yeah. copy credit meal, see what they say on the all these casting breakdowns. We're family. Come on. Yeah, and I think it at the very very beginning it does help, but I also learned quickly that like it's it's a good way to meet people, but after that if you keep doing them, everybody just expects you to work for free. Mm -hmm. So. You know, I, I've met a lot of great people. I've actually met, like, really good friends doing that job, too. So I, I do that. I'm very fortunate to be able to do those events. And uh, then just what I do like is that it's somewhat related to acting. You know, it's in the general sphere of a type of performance. Um, so any day on stage is a better a better day than not being on stage. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, I love that quote. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. Yeah, and so in the meantime, it's like, okay... Oh, I have an event this weekend, so I'll spend Friday night looking at the script, you know, print it out Saturday morning, um, get my suit on and everything, go do the event uh, Saturday night, and then Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Okay, uh, how can I get an audition this week? How can I, let's do another draft of the screenplay, right? And what else can I do to get the next gig and keep moving forward? Are you still training? Uh, yeah, I do. I train usually once a week, and I just train for myself now. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up getting more into Taekwondo and shifting towards that in college. I ended up competing on the Taekwondo team as well. 
And that was a great experience. You know, Taekwondo is an Olympic sport, so it's a little bit more widespread than Wushu. And I enjoyed it a lot. I always have really loved kicking. I have long legs and I love to kick. And so Taekwondo is a primarily kicking style from Korea. Mm-hmm. And so I even got to do some Taekwondo. I trained with the Taekwondo guys in in Beijing too, um, at my sports university. Mm-hmm. When I came back, after I finished competing, I won the Long Beach Grand Championship. I'm like, this is like the best it's gonna get, you know, unless it's been another three years. And so then I started taking Taekwondo classes at a great Taekwondo studio in my neighborhood. That actually a lot of like actors used to train at and some actors still train at. Mm-hmm. And so now I train on my own or sometimes with friends and it's mostly Taekwondo related. Unless I have a performance coming up when I need to do Kung Fu or Wushu and I, I get back to that train. Fucking wild, man. It's fun, man. It's just I just do it because I love it. I trained this morning actually and I have to stretch out, you know, do all the splits and stuff because you have to really keep that stuff up. Um it's much harder to get it back than it is to maintain it. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Wow. I mean, it's uh, you've had a fucking hell of a run. I can't wait to see what you're going to get up to next. I appreciate that. I can't wait either. I mean, you know, same, same for you. Like, we all hope, I think, that the next act is the biggest act. And then you keep going, and then maybe the next act after that is the biggest act. And, like, what else can we do to move forward? I always want to look forward, you know. Well, the only thing you can't do is stop. Like, once you stop, yeah. the, dream, the dream dies. Yeah, absolutely. So if as long as you're not stopping, you're still living the dream. And always trying something new, right? Like you're doing with your podcast. Actually, the latest thing I started doing, I started uh, working a little bit in sports coverage. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm working with a gentleman who, he hosts the Heisman Trophy podcast. Oh, nice. So uh, he saw my short film, my martial arts one that I mentioned. And then he's like, hey, uh, so can you edit promos for me from for the podcast oh nice so i've been working on that and he also works on or he owns a website that covers usc basketball and i'm a i'm a big basketball fan actually i didn't mention this but i love basketball me too um i know you do <laughs> that's we well, should come to a usc game actually I'd l- yeah i'd love to now that now that Bronny's not there so we got better players now uh, yeah. i mean you know he made some good plays at usc too i don't want to denigrate him but um he really came through a lot of adversity to even get on the court It's a completely different team now. It's a totally different team. It's actually a lot of really experienced guys. They're all like 50-year seniors. New coach, Mm -hmm. too. And um, I'm actually going to a practice tomorrow, and Mm -hmm. I do write-ups for it. I I go to games. Uh, There's been one game so far this season just starting out, Mm -hmm. and I've been doing write-ups of that, so it's been really fun. That's great, yeah. I really want to go to the Clippers' new uh, arena, the Intuit Dome, and go. And I've been looking at, uh, there's tickets... I want to see Steph Curry play. So the uh, Golden State are in L.A. at the Clipper Dome or whatever on the 18th of November. So I want to try to get to that. Well, Steph Curry, I mean, did you watch him light it up at the Olympics? I, I mean, did. You know. Yeah, it was just kind of he got into the total zone. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's one of those guys where his zone is like laser sharp. You know, some guys have like a good game. Steph Curry has a superhuman game where anything he just he'll throw it up like this and it'll be a full court shot. that will go in. He's amazing. What a talent. Yeah. 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 Wild. So, I mean, you feeling good? Like we're two hours in. You, you want to, you want to, you, you know, got anything else you want to, you got anything else you want to talk about? Or are you, you feeling, feeling like we covered some good stuff? I think we covered a lot of great stuff. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, we could keep talking. We'll probably keep talking off camera. Sure. Um, but, you know, learning about all your experiences has been really, really great. It's so interesting to hear about other creatives who have forged their own path and created all these different avenues just by doing stuff that they love. That's so important. Yeah. I guess it goes back to just like what we said earlier about when you do something and you don't care about the result, not only does it help you get better, but I don't know, there's just some kind of aura about that that somehow makes other people interested too. Well, just do, just keep doing cool shit. Like for anyone out there, like if someone gives you $1,000, do something cool with it. If someone gives you $10,000, do something cool with it. Someone gives you $100,000, do something cool with it, right? Yeah. You're making TV shows and people are giving you millions of dollars, do something cool with it. Like, just fucking live some kind of elevated experience and, uh, and, and, and share it with people. Like, and if you're, you know, if you have the chance to film it or, or you have the chance to hire a crew or whatever and, you, and, you, and you, you get to put something together and then share it with a wide audience, like, that's a fucking dream. But just don't stop doing cool stuff. Like, Find out where your comfort zone is, push past it. Find out where your comfort zone is, push past it. And just keep using whatever money you can raise or whatever money you can get your hand on to like just keep expanding 
your comfort zone. And then, yeah. and then by doing that, like, you know, you'll, you'll start attracting the energy you want in your life. I think. Yeah. The, there's a, a book called letters to a young poet. Have you ever heard of it? No, I haven't. Um, it's by this famous poet named Rainer Maria Rilke. He's German. And in the first letter in that book, he says the artist much must go towards what is difficult. Always. Use that as your guide. Mm -hmm. If it's hard, then you're on the right path. Agreed. Yeah. Don't don't take the easy way out. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, epic. Well, look, hey, we can go up here to number four. Show everyone we're in the same room. No podcast, no Zooms. I hate the online stuff. No, we got to do it in person, man. It's great to meet different. you. Likewise. Come back anytime. Thank you. I appreciate that. Don't worry. And now we fade to black and we're out. Bones.